Aha! A snowstorm's coming! Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers! Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards! I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing! Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. OMG! It's a boy! No, an angel with blonde hair! My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? Uh, help me. No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God! Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around. On the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight! I'm speeding up! We went up a hill, then through a pine forest, and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, Beavis spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Eldon and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis's ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra-large kitty. Then Eldon and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside, and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. W while waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we we're going to do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how can my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I... How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Eldon and Ira that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rana, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right. I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Eldon and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right. Worry? Or are you just jealous of me? 
I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun! It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Yara to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people are rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and nonstop? While I hesitated to take a step, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beavis explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions, and today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose, a weird-looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice. Don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. I... Suddenly, a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Our, Our beloved, beloved daughter, daughter has, has returned. returned. I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. <sighs> everything happens so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. <gasps> when I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me? No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But... Just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Eldon. So I called Ira to catch up on things and asked for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Ira nor Beavis had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Elden? See what you got yourself into, idiot. Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Ira already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? 
After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, there are Beavises. We should get out of this boring place. Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risk being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweetie, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I'd been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Alden and Bam. Alden signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then. If that's what he wants, let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis the preppy guy had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but... Don't you dare run away! Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis's evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car and in the driver's seat was... Era! Thank you, Ira. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and I'm sorry. It's okay, we're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brenna. Not all that glitters is gold. Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends? <sighs> Too much studying and not enough sleep was making me feel like a zombie. Chocolate would help, right? So, I drowsily walked downstairs. Huh? Why was my whole family there with their suitcases? Um, are you guys going somewhere? Yes, Colorado for a ski trip. <gasps> That's awesome! You're the best, Daddy! Not you, Helen. You have studying to do. And this is a special award for Christine for winning her scholarship. What? 
So you're just going to leave me out because of some meaningless grades? This is so unfair. Ugh, whatever. I don't even need them to go with me. Shh, come here. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. I can go to the ski resort by myself and have way more fun. But how, you ask? It's called lucid dreaming. I first heard about it through the biggest buzz movie, Inception, and realized that I've had experienced the same things before. Since then, I've become an expert at this. So before I go to bed, I just have to write a script saying where I want to go, with whom, what I want to do, and three, two, one. I'm asleep and living my best life. In fact, I could say that those beautiful self-designed dreams are like meditation to me. Because, to be honest, my real life is tedious. No matter how hard I tried, I was no match for my younger half-sister, Christine. In my dad and grandma's eyes, a child of a doctor in physics, as well as a grandchild of a history professor, should automatically be a walking encyclopedia or something. But unfortunately, I didn't excel at the academic side of life. They treat Christine like this precious gemstone and me like some boring old rock. Every week usually entails her getting excellent grades or winning some reward, and all of my family lavishing her with gifts and praise, while I'm treated like an outsider in my own family. Ugh! Just thinking about it makes me want to scream. So, they want me to stay home and concentrate on tomorrow's test, huh? Nah, you wish. So, instead, I grabbed my pen and started writing tonight's awesome dream script. Let's see. That's right. The obnoxious Roger dared to heartlessly throw the candy I gave him in the trash, even though he'd been flirting with me. What a jerk. I will definitely retaliate against him tonight. Lying in bed, I closed my eyes and repeated this sentence. I'm going to kick him out of my life. And you won't believe it. In the dream, he kept chasing me like crazy, but I totally blanked him. (laughs) Helen, wake up. Time's running out. My best friend Gabby kicked my chair and I jolted awake. Oh no, there were only five minutes left. I frantically ticked on the paper and hurriedly submitted it to the monitor. Hey, did you not get any sleep or something? Well, I stayed up late writing the script for my dream. It was worth it as I got payback on Roger. What if you get a bad grade? Never mind. I'll be fine when I come home tonight with an A-plus dream. (laughs) But things turned out not to be as simple as I thought. That afternoon when I arrived home, I was about to sneak up to my bedroom to write my next amazing script when someone grabbed my bag strap and pulled me back. It was grandma and dad, and both of them seemed to be mad. How long are you going to live like this? Education is important to this family, yet you don't seem to care. Do you realize this week alone your teacher has contacted me three times? But dad, I really don't like those boring subjects. I only like no more drawing or writing your silly stories. You need to focus on your studies, else you'll end up a useless person like... She suddenly stopped, which made me curious. Like who? But neither she nor my dad said anything. They just quietly walked away, leaving me alone. Honestly, I never wanted to disappoint them that much. So this time I was going to try my best to not let them down. Dad! Grandma! Look, look! I got a B plus in my math test. No one cared what I said. My stepmom cuddled Christine and looked at her with sparkling eyes. My wonderful daughter, I know the top student award is just a piece of cake to you, unlike someone else. Then she turned to me and tutted, Helen, please, you're making a show of yourself. That's embarrassing. My face fell and I forced back tears. But I tried so hard to get this grade. A B plus is nothing to be proud of. I chucked my exam paper in the trash, then stormed up to my room. It didn't matter what I did or how hard I tried. This household would always treat me like a loser. Dream on, Helen. Go back to your happy place. In front of me was the crimson sunset sky. I'd been scripting this moment for so long, lounging lazily on the beach without anyone complaining. But suddenly the sky darkened and the inky clouds seemed intent on swallowing me. Huh? What was going on? This wasn't a part of the script. Terrified, I ran into a forest, but it was so dark and spooky here, and I tripped over a branch and fell. Ouch! As I rubbed my ankle and started crying my eyes out, suddenly a strange woman appeared. 
She took me into a wooden house at the end of the forest and gently helped bandage me up. This woman, well, she didn't scare me at all. Instead, I felt warm around her. Curious, I tried to take a closer look at her face, but then I suddenly woke up and realized tears were rolling down my cheeks. What a strange dream. I immediately drew all the things I'd seen. That forest, that house, but strangely, I couldn't remember that woman's face. Why are you drawing all this nonsense? My dad snatched the sketch from my hand and looked at it frowning. It appeared in my dream and... Get rid of them all. From now on, if I see you wasting your time on these stupid drawings again, there will be consequences. This was too much. I couldn't live without drawing. It was the only thing keeping me sane. I had to get out of here. Live my way. Forget them and their stupid standards. I would create my own world. I planted myself in Gabby's room, and this is where I've been for almost a week. Luckily, Gabby's parents are totally chill with me staying. As for my family, pfft, they haven't messaged me once. And yes, dreams do go on. But now I dreaded going to sleep as my lucid dreams were still all messed up. Sometimes beautiful, sometimes bad. And for the most part, it did not turn out the way I wanted it to anymore. Until one day, that creepy forest appeared again. No matter how much I screamed to wake myself up, I still couldn't get out of that nightmare. Panicked, I kept running and running in the hope of finding a safe place till I saw that woman. And once again, she reached out her hand to help me. This time, I wouldn't miss my chance. I looked carefully at her face, remembering every detail, and as soon as I woke up, I drew her. Wow, I didn't know you watched this kind of show. <laughs> Gabby giggled. What show? Look, she's a celebrity. She hosts some TV show that my mom watches sometimes. So, that woman is a real person? If so, I have to find her. I didn't really know what was going on. Only that there was something tying me to this woman and I needed to figure this out. Luckily, Gabby has an uncle who works at the studio and he gave us special passes to meet this host in the flesh. When the cameras stopped filming, she turned and saw me and her eyes widened in alarm. Helen? Helen, is it really you? Then she rushed over and hugged me. Huh? What did she just say? We didn't know each other and... The weird thing is, this hug didn't feel strange at all. Instead, I felt the same warmth as when she'd taken care of me in my dream. As she loosened her embrace on me and gave me this beaming smile, I said, Um, and you are? Darling, it's me, your mother. That's when I realized something. Of course she was my mom! Look! We had the same eyes! Needless to say, this was a huge shock— we hugged each other for a long time in tears. Then mom took me backstage, got me a glass of water, then she told me everything. So after I was born, mom once got caught up in a cheating scandal. Dad was angry about the damage this would do to his career, so he kicked her out of the house and wouldn't let her see me. A long time later, she found out that grandma was behind everything, just because she didn't approve of this marriage, so she came up with that plan. But why didn't you ever try to find me when you've always been living this close. Oh, no, sweetie. I've always kept an eye on you. One time, years ago, I saw you playing in the park. You had your hair and pigtails, and uh, I tried to approach you, but your dad threatened me. He is a very powerful man who's actually capable of destroying my life, and I didn't think it was fair to drag you through all of that. But things have changed now. I'll never leave you alone, ever again. I strolled into the house like normal, and everyone stopped what they were doing and glared at me with disgust. Oh, you're back. If you're not prepared to study properly, then don't bother staying. I took a deep breath, then said, You can't treat me like this anymore. I try my best, and it's not fair that you punish me for just being me. So I'm leaving, and I'm never coming back. Psst. Where will you go? That's when mom walked in. Oh God, you should have seen the looks on their faces. Grandma actually looked like she'd swallowed a swarm of wasps. I stood by and let you manipulate and control me well no more. I'm taking my daughter and we're going to have the life we both deserve. Then, ignoring their angry words, she grabbed my arm and led me out of there. 
So that's the moment when I left home and moved in with my mom. Now I draw as much as I want. In fact, mom's letting me create a mural on the living room wall. It's going to be epic when it's finished. Oh, and about the lucid dreams, I don't write scripts anymore. Instead, I realize that I'm better off focusing on my reality and making myself the best version of myself I can be. After all, as great as a dream world can be, it's nowhere near as good as experiencing life firsthand. Admit it. Come on. You took my necklace, didn't you? Mindy looked at us and shook her head. She was sweating. Well, there are only three of us in this house, and if Andy didn't take it, then obviously it was you. Seriously, Cass, you got to believe me I didn't take it. But clearly she was lying, because when I rummaged through her bag, Cass's necklace was right there. Cass told her to get out of her house, and Mindy burst into tears. Poor Mindy. I really wanted to stop Cass, but she seriously hates people touching her stuff, so I just kept quiet. You see, Cass and I are pretty much joint at the hip. We've always lived in the same neighborhood, so we grew up together and shared everything. Well, almost everything. Except one little secret that would probably ruin our friendship forever if she found out about it. Andy, what are you doing? I started to stammer. Uh, um, uh, um, this is so cute. Honestly, I'm so upset about Mindy. I can't believe she'd do something like that. I smiled, not knowing what to say. I mean, it was me who had exposed her. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. Right at that moment, we got to the checkout. Cass took everything out of the cart to give to the cashier. Hang on, she exclaimed. What is this? This item has the barcode ripped off. The cashier made a fuss for a while and even called the manager. Cass and I stood there for ages, trying to figure out what was going on. Cass even started crying, thinking she'd be accused of shoplifting. After about 30 minutes, the store manager came and told us we could leave. They kept the items that had no barcodes and sent us on our way. Phew, that was close. What? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I'm just relieved that we didn't get into any trouble. Just so you know, though, that wasn't the first time we'd got ourselves into an awkward situation while out shopping. Sometimes it was the torn barcodes. Sometimes the tags were missing. Then the security alarm would always go off at the door. And all of these situations weren't just coincidences. Okay, I gotta be honest here. The thing is, I have a habit of pilfering. Not because I can't afford stuff. I mean, my dad's the owner of a bank, so money isn't the issue. My dad basically buys me the latest phone every month. And you should see my wardrobe. I have all the designer bags. I steal because it gives me the kind of thrill that my boring daily life just can't give me. My dad just hands me money every day. And never stops to think that... Maybe I'd like a hug, or a how are you, ever since my mom left when I was just a baby. He's been using money as a way to keep the peace. So one day when I was in elementary school, I stole a hairpin from the girl who sat next to me. It felt so good, like my own little secret. I loved the drama that came with it, and the fact that no one ever suspected me, because I was such a rich little girl. After the hairpin, I got addicted to stealing little things and couldn't stop. It felt like the only thing I could control in my life, and so I kept on doing it. And here I am now, still getting a buzz from it every single time. And yep, you've guessed it. The one who took the necklace at Cass's sleepover was none other than me, of course. But at that time, because I was so scared, I slipped the necklace into Mindy's bag and pretended to find it there. I was deep in thought when suddenly Alex's scream startled me. Guys, I've lost my unicorn pen. You know the pen that glows? The whole class was suddenly in uproar. Some friends were trying to look for it. Meanwhile, Alex was walking straight towards me. Andrea must have taken it. This morning when I took out the pen, me and her were the only ones in here. I looked up at Alex, my heart pounding in my chest. This is it. I'm so done this time. Then I suddenly looked over at Scott Parker the cute boy who just transferred to our class. Oh no, I couldn't give him a bad impression of me. I had to quickly think of a way out of this. You waited until I went to the bathroom to take it, didn't you? Alex, I'd never do such a thing. Besides, I have loads of nice pens. In fact, you can have one if you'd like. I pulled out a beautiful pink rhinestone pen from my pencil case and handed it to Alex. While Alex stared in awe at my pen, I suggested everyone go check their lockers to see if her pen was there. 
Sure enough, right by the lockers was the glowing unicorn pen she'd lost. Right in front of Scott. I picked up the pen and handed it to Alex. I'm so upset you thought I'd steal this from you. But it's okay. At least we found it. Alex blushed and apologized to me. Our other friends also blamed Alex for not looking for it carefully enough and for jumping to conclusions about me. Next time, don't be so silly. Andrea is a good person. Besides, her family is so wealthy. Why would she need to steal a pen from you? I just smiled and walked away. Suddenly, a voice called out from behind me. It was Scott. He looked at me and said, Wow, that was totally dramatic. I'm Scott, by the way. You're Andrea, right? I'm sorry if this is a bit forward, but here's my number. Excuse me? Am I dreaming? Of course, I texted him as soon as I got home. He said he was so impressed with how I'd handled being blamed for the whole thing. Soon we were chatting every day, and eventually he asked me to be his girlfriend. I was so happy. But there was just one small problem. Ever since we'd started dating, I felt really ashamed about my bad habit of stealing things. I was determined to give it up, but it wasn't going to be easy. One day, Scott came to pick me up and asked if I wanted to go to the bookstore. A bookstore? No, I don't want to go there. Can we go somewhere else? Please? Seeing me panic like that, Scott looked puzzled. Then he suggested we go to his place to watch a movie, which I was fine with. Hopefully there would be no temptations for stealing there. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us at Scott's place. Oh, this is Sandra, our maid. Hi, Sandra. I'm Andrea. But instead of saying hi back, Sandra just stared at me in a seriously creepy way. It actually sent shivers down my spine. After watching the movie, Scott and his mom invited me to stay for dinner. Scott's mother, Mrs. Doris Parker, was really sweet, and we had some interesting chats. While waiting for dessert, I got up to go to the bathroom. But as I stepped out there, I almost bumped into Sandra. She was just standing there staring at me again. Uh, sorry. She didn't say anything, but just kept staring at me in this weird way. Oh my gosh, why was she looking at me like that? The next morning at school, Scott told me his mother had just lost a valuable ring. She had a jewelry tray next to the bathroom sink, and after washing her hands, she'd forgotten to put her ring on. After dinner, the ring was no longer there. I comforted Scott, then made an excuse to go to the ladies' room. I needed to seriously think about this. Honestly, I'd tried my best to not get the urge to steal at Scott's place. But when I'd seen Doris's beautiful ring, no, I had to find a way to return it. No one could find out about this. And I had sworn to myself that I would never let this happen again. Hello, Sam. Huh? Where's Sandra? Oh, she was fired. Mrs. Parker said Sandra had stolen her jewelry. Anyway, may I help you? Oh, no. I had to return this ring immediately. Poor Sandra. Scott came down for me and said he'd make dinner. I glanced through the window to find Doris was having tea in the garden. This was my chance. I snuck up to her room, quietly tiptoed in, and headed towards her jewelry box. Suddenly, the light came on. Tell me what on earth are you doing here? I quickly turned around, dropping the ring to the floor. M Mindy? Why are you here? I'm Scott's cousin. So it was you who stole the ring. I can't believe my cousin is dating you. Hearing the noise, Scott and his mom ran upstairs while I was still dumbfounded and speechless. It was you who stole Cass's necklace too, wasn't it? She won't even speak to me because of you. I'm so sorry. I know it's not okay, but I couldn't stop myself. I've been feeling so guilty, so that's why I'm returning it. I was still kneeling on the ground when a hand reached out to me and helped me stand up. I'll handle this. Come on, let's have a chat outside, shall we? Turns out Mrs. Parker is a therapist. She could see I had a problem and offered to help me. I told her how guilty I'd been feeling about Sandra getting fired and asked Doris if she could call her for me so I could apologize. Thirty minutes later, Sandra arrived. As soon as Doris saw her, she apologized and offered her the job back. But no, no, ma'am, I was the one who stole it, and I deserve to be punished. I'm sorry, Sandra, I've already confessed to Mrs. Parker that I stole the ring. I didn't mean to get you fired. I just couldn't help it. You didn't do anything wrong. I it was me? I was greedy? She is innocent. What on earth is going on? Obviously, I was the thief, so why was she defending me? Why are you doing this? Do we know each other, Sandra? And that's when the truth came pouring out. Sandra 
was my mom. Yeah, I don't know how this is possible either. So according to her words, she'd had a huge fight with my dad when I was a baby, and she'd fled to another city where she found a job working for Scott's family. When they moved to Seattle, she came with them. Even though she was nervous about returning back to where me and my dad were, she'd carried so much guilt about leaving us, and never in a million years did she expect to bump into me at Scott's house. I was so shocked, I couldn't even speak. I'd imagined this moment my whole life, and now... Here I was, standing face to face with her, and she'd even taken the blame for me. I couldn't believe it. Mom, I'm so sorry that I stole the ring. I I can't believe you're really here. Sweetie, you don't need to apologize. I'm the one who will be apologizing for the rest of my life, abandoning my daughter like that. What kind of mom am I? How will you ever forgive me? We stood there hugging for what felt like forever, and I knew in that moment that I'd never steal again. Doris diagnosed me as having kleptomania due to a lack of love from my mom, but now that my mom was back, I had no reason to seek out those thrills from stealing. I had everything I needed right here. There were a few moments where I almost stole again, but Doris told me to call my mom as soon as I felt the urge, and when my mom picked up the phone and I heard her voice, the urge faded, and I felt so much better. Scott and Cass and Mindy forgave me after Doris sat them all down and explained more about my addiction and where it stemmed from. Now, Scott and I are still together, and I see my mom every day at Scott's place. My dad hasn't forgiven my mom for leaving yet, but baby steps. Finally, I feel like everything is complete, and my pilfering is a thing of the past. Finally, after an 11-hour flight, I arrived at LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. It's awesome! I can't wait to see my mom. You see, my dad's French and my mom's American. We used to all live together in France, but then they split up and mom moved back here. Of course, I've talked to her on FaceTime and stuff, but this will be the first time I've properly seen her in five years. I haven't visited before because mom's a super successful businesswoman and she works really hard. That meant she wouldn't have the time to provide me with the attention I needed. But now that I'm 16, and I can look after myself, I'm finally able to visit. So, thanks to my dad and stepmom for my plane ticket birthday present, I'm now in sunny LA for a whole month. Not only do I get to spend time with mom, but I also get to chill out in her enormous villa. (sighs) Ah, bliss. But first, let's get all my luggage, then find a taxi to my mom's. Yeah, unfortunately, she couldn't come to pick me up since she had some work to do. But no problem, I can handle this myself. Okay, maybe I spoke too soon. It's been half an hour and my luggage was nowhere to be seen. Then, this handsome guy approached me and said, Hey, looks like your luggage has gone AWOL. Do you need any help? Cute and helpful. Hmm, I could totally get used to US guys. I showed him my ticket and turns out I was waiting at the wrong carousel. Oops. After guiding me to the correct one, this guy, whose name I found out was Zach, even pulled my luggage down for me. But one of my cases got stuck and burst open, causing everything to tumble out. Girl, it's not your lucky day, is it? He burst out laughing. Oh well, at least it wasn't all bad. I mean, a cute guy had rescued me, right? He helped me pick up my things, then he offered to drive me to my mom's house. After some 30 minutes, he began to slow down. I looked out the window and, oh my god, this is the chicest villa ever. The pool, the tennis court, the palm trees. It was exactly like a movie star home. I was gawping at the villa when suddenly I heard a car engine sound. Startled, I turned around to see Zach zooming away. My suitcases! I yelled. Ugh, my laptop and iPad were in there too. Oh God, why is this happening to me? And on my very first day in the US? At least I still had my phone and passport with me. Phew, so I called my mom. Needless to say, I was a distraught mess when she arrived. Who'd have thought that such a kind looking guy would turn out to be a thief? Anyways, my mom could buy me new clothes and things and I could still have an amazing time in her villa right? Mom led me to my room and told me to get some rest. 
After that disaster, I was dead exhausted, so I quickly fell asleep on the comfiest bed ever. When I awoke, it was dark outside. I realized I hadn't eaten anything since the flight, so I went downstairs and checked the fridge and cupboards. Huh? They were all empty. I was still digging around in the kitchen when my mom returned with some burgers. Sweetie, I only got back from my business trip yesterday, so I haven't had time to go to the grocery store. Let's just eat fast food today, okay? I didn't mind, as it was awesome to have dinner with my mom again after such a long time. I took a look around the room. There was barely any furniture here. My mom said that's minimalism, a trendy lifestyle in LA nowadays. Less is more. How cool is that? The next morning we went out, but what's with that old rusty car? Seeing my confused look, she quickly explained that this was only temporary as her car was being serviced. But then mom couldn't get the garage door to open. Turns out, normally she had her own chauffeur. But since I've traveled thousands of miles to visit her, she wanted to drive herself. Huh, how sweet. In the following days, my mom and I enjoyed ourselves in LA. Sunbathing by the pool, spa days, shopping. This is definitely the best vacation of my life. At least until... That morning, I was awoken by a loud quarrel. Looking down from the stairs, I saw Mom in the living room with a strange woman. She was pointing at the couch. Jeez, that's where I spilled soy sauce yesterday while eating sushi. Then Mom appeared and sounded flustered. She told me to quickly pack my things as we were leaving. Um, Mom, is there something wrong? Oh, nothing, sweetie. It's just that the couch is dirty, so let's just get someone in to clean the entire villa. Wow, Mom would deep clean the whole house just because of a soy sauce stain? How rich is she? So, where will we stay this time? A luxurious five-star hotel? Or a magnificent mansion in Beverly Hills? <sighs> but then the car came to a stop in front of some shabby apartment building. Huh? This couldn't be right. Mom told me this was her friend's spare apartment, so we would stay here a few days for convenience. Elena, it's probably best if you stay away from the people in this area. They don't have the same lifestyle as us. You know what I mean. Ugh. Yeah, this place was the opposite of the villa. Cramped room, hard bed and the bathroom didn't even have a bathtub. Since moving here, Mom didn't take me out anymore. In the evenings, she dressed up all elegantly and went out to her fancy work meetings. On one such evening, I was sitting alone watching YouTube, munching on french fries for the fifth time this week, when there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and standing there was a scruffy guy, claiming to be Frankie, the landlord's son. I told him there must be a mistake, as we were only here for a few days. Then I went to close the door, but he blocked it with his foot. Miss Anita has rented this apartment for two years. What do you mean a few days? I just saw her take a cab at the front door. Don't lie to me. No, my mom is a successful businesswoman who has a villa in Brentwood Park. Then you must have mistaken your mom for someone else. In short, remind your businesswoman mom to pay the rent. Then he sneered and walked away. How dare he say that? And why did I keep on running into jerks? Ugh! When Mom returned, I told her what had happened. I thought she'd find it funny or something, but nope. Instead, she got really mad. You shouldn't have opened the door to him. I told you not to socialize with the people here. Okay, hearing made-up lies about yourself like that must suck, but did she have to be so furious about it? The next morning, I was drinking tea on the balcony when suddenly I saw a familiar face passing by down the street. My god, it was the jerk from the airport. Zack! That thief! I shouted, rushing down, but when I got there, he disappeared. I was still exasperated when a voice came from behind. What on earth are you doing screaming this early in the morning? I turned around to see Frankie leaning against the wall with his arms folded. None of your business, swindler. Huh? Swindler? What do you mean? Quit lying. I already told my mom all about you trying to con money out of me. Hmm, is that so? So, 
You think I'm the liar? Before I could answer that provoking question, I heard my mom's voice calling down from the balcony. Hey, rich girl, if you want a reality check, I suggest you come meet me tonight and we'll go follow your mom. Mom appeared and frowning, asked me why I was talking to Frankie. I blurted out something about asking for directions, then quickly entered the room and closed the door. Frankie was clearly a thieving, lying jerk, right? But then, why were his words lingering in my mind? I had noticed a few strange things, such as when we were at the villa, I asked mom where the cutlery was, but she couldn't remember. But then in this apartment, she immediately got it. Plus, why was there a photo of her in the bedroom when this was her friend's place? That night, when mom was getting ready to go out again, I spotted her necklace. Only, it was actually my necklace. The one that had been stolen along with the rest of my stuff. My dad got that necklace custom made just for me, so it was a one of a kind, but why did mom have it? I complimented her on it and asked her where she'd got it from. Blushing, she excitedly told me that this rich man she'd just started dating had bought it for her. Then she said he was taking her for dinner tonight. I forced a smile, but my head was filled with questions. Who really was... Mom? I secretly followed my mom down the street. Suddenly, a hand patted my shoulder. Let's go. I turned around and it was Frankie. Without saying anything, I nodded and quickly got into his car, and we followed Mom's taxi. Hold on. Isn't that the villa we stayed in before? After a while, a luxury car arrived, taking my mom to a nearby expensive restaurant. We peered through the glass wall. There she was. My mom was sitting there, smiling and talking with some man in a suit. Was she pretending to live in that villa to trick that man? Was my mom a gold digger? I couldn't watch any more of this, so I pulled on Frankie's arm. But weirdly, he seemed to be as shocked as I was. Um, wasn't this your idea? So why the pale face? He just shook his head and took me home. We waited in the apartment for Mum to return, and oh boy, it was tense. Around midnight, we heard the door open, and Mum walked in and looked at us in alarm. She started shooing Frankie out of there but I interrupted her. Mom, I know everything. You've lived here for two years. You're poor, and you scam rich men. Sweetie, it's not like that. Please calm down and I'll explain everything to you. So it turns out, after divorcing my dad, she was determined to go back to the US and succeed at business. But she failed, and she was so embarrassed, she lied to me and dad. Then when she heard that I was coming to visit, she spent the little savings she had on renting a swanky villa for me. But when I accidentally spilled soy sauce on that expensive couch, she couldn't afford to fix it, so we were kicked out. As for the man I was with tonight, I ran into him while walking outside the villa. He's rich and nice. He likes me and I like him too. But what about that necklace? Mom, it's actually mine. It was in my stolen suitcase. My mom gave me a confused look, but before she could say anything, Frankie blurted out, That man's a fraud. Mom and I gaped at Frankie as he turned to me and said, I'm sorry, but I think you guys need to know the truth. Then Frankie told us how that man was none other than Zach's dad. After taking me back to the villa, Zach figured my mom was rich so he persuaded his dad to come and flirt with her. But how did you dig up the dirt on these guys? Because I know Zach. When I saw Lana chasing him, I knew he'd stolen from her. But he's my friend. Great, so you've both been lying to me. Then I rushed into my room, locked the door, and burst into tears. The next morning, Mom knocked on my door, but I ignored her. Elena, I get that you're upset with me, but I've left a sandwich here, so please at least eat something. I'm really sorry. Just wanted to be the perfect mother for you. Her words caused me to sob all over again. But I can say, from the bottom of my heart, I feel sorry for her. After that, I opened the door and hugged her tightly, and then we both blubbered into each other's arms. I'm leaving L.A. today. 
with Mum. She's moving back to France with me, where she can start afresh. While I was dragging my suitcase to the taxi, Frankie appeared and apologized to me. I just shrugged and told him it didn't matter anymore. I mean, at least he came clean in the end and saved my mum from that swindler. Hey, rich girl, good luck. And, um, feel free to keep in touch. So, what now? Well, mum is settling back into French life. She has a new job and a chic apartment. I go and stay with her each weekend, and it's good to finally spend time with the real her. As for Frankie, well, we send each other lots of Snapchats. So, okay, maybe I kinda like him. I'm planning to visit him in the summer. Hopefully my next trip to the U.S. won't be as crazy as my last one. (laughs) I was casually walking along the hallway, just minding my own business, when I felt a cold breeze rush through the hallway. I turned my head to see, and oh, it was Natasha. I didn't mean to look her in the eye, but I did. Oh no, was she going to hit me? Panicked, I quickly glared down at my feet. My heart was thudding with fear, and inside my head, I repeated, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. But to my relief, she walked past me. Phew! Hi, I'm Marcus, and you might be wondering why I'm so afraid of that girl, right? Well, there's a reason why her nickname is Silent But Deadly. She's the tallest girl in the school. Intimidating, and she never utters a word. The school was full of rumors about her, such as how the last kid who messed with her ended up in intensive care. Nobody, and I mean nobody, should ever look her in the eye, not unless they want to end up unconscious. I definitely just had a lucky escape. Thankfully, not all the girls in my school were as terrifying as Natasha. Nope, instead there was this really cute girl named Naomi. She's beautiful, sweet, and gentle. Only, she's also super popular and is dating Nicholas the captain of the basketball team. So I just kept my feelings to myself and carried on with my life. (sighs) But wait, where's my notebook? I guess I left it back in the science lab. So I rushed in there and, oh no, Nicholas was there and he was reading my notebook. I quickly grabbed it off of him, but it was too late. He'd already taken pictures of the song lyrics I wrote about my feelings for Naomi. Blast it! So let me get this straight. A nerd like you dares to daydream about Naomi? Uh, but we have a problem here. She's my girlfriend. Don't you know that? Uh, wait, it's not like that. I'll stay away from her, I promise. Nicholas gave me this unnerving look. Ugh, no good thing could ever come from a look like that. I braced myself for what he was about to do next. You have to do everything I say, else I'm gonna ruin your life. Huh? Was he being serious? Judging by his devious smirk, yep, he was 100% being serious. I want you to ask Natasha out. Make sure you do it in front of the whole class. What? Natasha? That scary girl? How could I? If you say no, the entire school will know about this. Then he waved his phone in front of me. Ugh, that vile Nicholas. But I couldn't risk my song being sent to everyone. So it looked like I had no choice. So the following day, I walked over to Natasha's desk and asked her, Natasha, um, will you be my girlfriend? The whole class was silent. Then they burst out laughing. She glared at me. Ugh, this wasn't good. I winced, preparing for the death punch. But instead, she let me out into a corner of the hallway. Then she gave me this weak smile, followed by a nod. Oh my god, did she just agree to be my girlfriend? This is crazy. It was completely beyond my expectations. But, whew, at least I was still alive, right? And that's how I ended up dating the scariest girl in school. She never spoke to me, not even a word. So I just helped her with her studies and carried her stuff around. We also exchanged numbers, but we only chatted through messages. Then one day when I was on my way to have lunch with Natasha... Nicholas strolled over to me and told me I had to take her to the cinema to catch this awful-looking rom-com, which didn't seem like her thing at all. But what other choice did I have? Nicholas' words were orders. So I asked her over lunch, and to my surprise, Natasha smiled, then gave me a big thumbs up as agreement. When I went to pick up Natasha, she was already waiting for me on her porch. She walked over with a notepad. Curious, I asked her why she had it, and she wrote, I won't be able to text you during the movie, so this will have to do. Yep, 
Natasha has always been different from everyone else, so I didn't ask anymore. During the film, I noticed Natasha was crying. So when it was over and we stopped for lunch, I teased her. I saw you crying during the movie. She slammed her notepad on the table after she wrote, I was not crying. I just laughed and took her home. Hmm, maybe she wasn't as scary as the rumors made her out to be. To be honest, she was also quite cute. <laughs> the more time I spent with Natasha, the more I started to warm to her. There was something I liked about her, even though we had only communicated through sticky notes. I was desperate to hear her voice, so I hatched a plan. When we were in the library on a study date, I picked up an old book and blew the dust in her face. She almost sneezed. But before she did, she placed her hand over her mouth and raced into the girl's bathroom. Then she returned wearing a mask. After that, I tried to make her laugh. I quickly took two pencils from the table and stuffed them into my nose and started making ugly faces. But Natasha just glared at me and handed me a note. If you continue to do these ridiculous things, there will be payback. Ha! Huh, no way was I giving up. So the next day, when I saw her by her locker, I rushed over to her and began imitating the voices of the minions. I thought it would definitely work this time, but no. Instead, she punched me in the arm. Ouch! Yep, I now learned that the rumor about her inhuman strength was not an exaggeration. So I just gave up and our relationship continued. Then one weekend, when I was at Natasha's house to study, I went down to the kitchen to get a drink, just as her mom returned from the grocery store. As I helped her unpack, we started talking. She told me about Natasha's love of collecting glass art, the pieces of which filled the house. Then her mom touched my shoulder and thanked me for making her daughter happy again. Oh man, this was awkward. Now I felt super bad. To divert the convo, I asked if Natasha talked at home, but she just smiled and replied, Natasha's such a quiet kid, right? Then she told me how it's because Natasha's always been taller than the other kids, but she has a squeaky voice. This led to lots of teasing, and once she got so upset, she pushed a boy over and accidentally caused him to have a nosebleed. Since then, people started to shun her, so she withdrew from herself and stayed silent. Hearing this made me feel so guilty. What I was doing was wrong, and Natasha didn't deserve this. Then her mom said something that truly shocked me. In middle school, this one girl named Naomi was horrible to all. The mean comments got so bad she refused to go into school for weeks at a time. Huh? Naomi? The same Naomi I know? No way! Confused, I told Natasha's mom I needed to leave and left her looking bewildered as I ran out of there. My mind was a mess. I had a crush on a mean girl. And I'm just as bad, if not worse, after what I did to Natasha. Then my phone rang with a text from Natasha. It said, Sorry if my mom said something she shouldn't have. You okay? I texted back. We need to talk tomorrow, please. So we decided to meet at her house the next day. Alone in her living room, I told her everything, including my notebook, liking Naomi and how Nicholas was blackmailing me. Natasha, please, you have to believe me. I'm sorry I did this to you. I saw the hurt look in her eyes. Then she threw a note at me and ran to her room. The note told me to get out, but before I did, I stood on the other side of her door. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I couldn't continue our relationship on a lie. Look, I like you, and I don't want to deceive you anymore. After that, I left, and I also texted Nicholas that I didn't care if he told everyone. I'm done being his puppet. The next day, I expected school to be intolerable, but to my surprise, nothing happened. Instead, I saw that Natasha was trying to sort out her locker. A crowd had gathered around her, and Naomi was taunting her. How does it feel to know that even your boyfriend likes me more? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Natasha carried on sorting out her books, but I could see that she was fighting back tears. Furious, I pushed past them all and told Naomi to stop. She just jokingly said, You know, if you wanted to date me, you could have just asked. You didn't have to spend so many months suffering with this giant scarecrow. You're right. I did like you back when I thought you were a nice person. But now I know the true you. You're a coward who only feels good when it's at the expense of someone's misery. And I can see why you target Natasha the most because she has two things you'll never have, a true kind heart and a loving spirit. After that, I pulled Natasha away and told her how sorry I am. But she didn't even glance at me and just walked off. A few days later, after PE class, I was about to go to the locker room when a classmate, Dante, came up to me. Marcus, help me carry the PE equipment into the storage room, please. I have a stomachache. 
He hugged his stomach, then hurriedly ran away. Without thinking much, I packed up the equipment and carried it into the storage room. As soon as I put it down, I realized that Nicholas, Naomi, and some guys from the basketball team were waiting there for me. Oh, well, Marcus, do you really like that weird Natasha? Didn't see that coming. Then the whole group burst into laughter. You have no right to say that to her. Take a look at yourself. Whoa, are you defending her? Then she turned to Nicholas. Babe, show him who's the boss here. Then she pulled out her phone and started recording. Nicholas smirked, then grabbed my shirt collar with one hand and reached out his fist to me with the other. I tried to struggle but couldn't get out. He was too strong. Knowing I was doomed, I closed my eyes and awaited his punch, but suddenly a loud shout came out. Stop! I opened my eyes to see Natasha and a teacher standing in front of the door. Turns out she overheard Dante bragging to some kid about Nicholas's plan. So she came to my rescue. I looked at her gratefully, but she turned away to avoid my gaze. Meanwhile, Nicholas hastily released my collar and lied to the teacher that we were just chatting. But of course, he didn't believe him and summoned them all to the supervisor's room. After that incident, Nicholas, Naomi, and the rest of the basketball team were suspended from school for two weeks. They deserved it. But who cares? I have more important things on my mind, such as winning back Natasha. I knew that her birthday was coming up, and I remembered how she loved glass art. So I bought her a glass art figure of Cinderella's glass slippers, with a ticket to senior prom and a card saying, Thank you, and happy birthday. I know what you did doesn't mean you forgive me, but I want to be your real boyfriend. So I left you a ticket for senior prom. If you come and dance with me, then I know you'll give me another chance. If not, then I know that it's over. But remember, you are a special person and deserve the best. The night of prom came and I was stuck there all alone feeling like a fool. This sucked, but after what I did, it was what I deserved. I didn't want to stick around here without her. So I was about to leave, but then my classmate tapped my shoulder and gestured for me to turn around. OMG. It was Natasha in the most beautiful crimson red dress. She walked over to me and then reached out her hand to ask me to dance. And of course, I accepted. As the song came to an end, she leaned in and whispered to me, Thank you, my hero. I can safely say that was the happiest night of my life, as it led to me having the best girlfriend ever. Oh, also her voice is actually really cute, although she does get annoyed with me when I tell her that. <laughs> Why wasn't it working? I followed all the steps, but still nothing. At that moment, my best friend Harry walked towards me and asked with a confused look, Hey, what you doing? <sighs> hey, Harry... I'm just working on this plan to become popular, but it isn't going so well. I changed my style and posted more on social media, but I'm still not cool. You're probably wondering why I was desperately wanting to be popular, right? Well, it's all because of my annoying hiccups. Last year, I was on stage performing the play Our Town when I suddenly started to hiccup, constantly. I couldn't stop, and the whole audience started to laugh at me. In the end, they had to replace me with my understudy. Not only was it the most humiliating moment of my life, but I've also been teased about it ever since. This year, I wanted to become popular. Then everyone would forget about the hiccuping incident. <sighs> if only becoming popular was easy. Hey, you could help me. No way! Your plan is crazy! At that moment, the new student, Amanda, passed by surrounded by a bunch of other students. Why is this girl so popular? I mean, she's only been here a week. You don't know? She's Dustin's sister. He's already the most popular guy in school. So being his sister makes her popular too. Duh. That's it, Harry. The fastest way for me to climb the popularity ladder is to date Dustin. At first, Harry seemed confused by this, but then he suddenly agreed to help me. With one condition, of course, that after I succeeded in becoming Dustin's girlfriend, I had to introduce Amanda to him. I knew it! He had a crush on her. Every guy in the school does. Fine, I'll help him, as I need Harry in this anyway. He plays a crucial role in my plan, and you'll soon figure out why. After school, I was waiting in a corner at the parking lot when Harry walked towards me, followed by Dustin. I heard you're giving tutor lessons. Yeah, that's right. I don't take money. I just need... 
What do you need? I need you to pretend to be my boyfriend. Dustin burst out laughing. But then when he saw our serious looks, he stopped. Um, you two are crazy. But I do need to pass math, so... Okay. However, my grades have to improve within two weeks. Then we have a deal. Deal? I grinned. Within two weeks? That's so easy. What a catch. You must be wondering how we managed to pull that off. Well, Harry's on Dustin's soccer team and overheard the coach tell him if he didn't improve his math grade, he'd be kicked off the team. Basically, we used Dustin's weakness to get the deal. <laughs> I know I had no chance with him by using my lousy flirting skills. So it's time to use my greatest strength, my brain. Pretty smart, huh? I started to tutor Dustin. Then after two weeks, he shot up two grades. And that's when he held up his end of the deal and pretended to be my boyfriend. The next day, Dustin and I held hands and walked into school. And just as I expected, everybody was gawping at us. I even heard them whisper about me, is that the hiccup girl with Dustin? And, whoa, since when were those two a thing? Ha, <laughs> and that's not all. Wherever I went, people would follow me. And in every class, everyone wanted to sit next to me. Finally, I was popular, and I loved it. i just finished tutoring Dustin at his house and was about to head home when his mom appeared and invited me to stay for dinner. Awkward, but I didn't want to be rude, so I said yes. Besides, this was a great opportunity to talk to Amanda. I was sitting next to Dustin at the dinner table when Amanda walked in and gave me a dirty look. What is she doing here? Amanda, manners! Um... Okay, had I upset her somehow? After we finished eating, I helped Amanda clean up. I pulled some homemade chocolate cookies out of my bag and gave my friendliest smile as I said, Um, my friend Harry, he likes you. I was wondering if... Without letting me finish my sentence, Amanda interrupted me. Sorry, let me stop you right there. First, I don't eat cookies. Gross. Second, I assume you're asking me if I want to go out with your friend, right? Um, no, because he's a loser just like you. It's embarrassing enough that Dustin is dating you. Then she walked off, leaving me standing there dumbfounded. Oh my god, couldn't believe what I just heard. How could a person be so rude? Ugh. The next day at school, I wanted to tell Harry to give up on Amanda, but as soon as I caught sight of him, he ran towards me hugged me and said, Emily, you're a matchmaking genius. Thank you. Huh? What do you mean by that? Amanda just asked me if I wanted to come to her party this weekend. Isn't that great? Yay! What on earth was going on? But Harry looked so happy that I just couldn't tell him the truth. One thing's for sure, there's something sus about Amanda. Of course, I was going to that party too, because I was Dustin's girlfriend, remember? Wow, we were actually at a cool kids party. Her first time ever. This was awesome. Harry even got a bit emotional. <laughs> what a baby. Dustin and I teamed up to play beer pong, and it was so much fun, and unexpectedly, we won. We were so excited, and both of us cheered with joy and hugged each other without thinking. Oops, didn't see that coming. But what happened next was even crazier. Everybody started to cheer, kiss, kiss, kiss. Oh boy, they couldn't be serious, right? I just laughed it off and hoped everyone would stop. But no, they just kept cheering on. Suddenly, Dustin grabbed my face and kissed me right on the lips. I didn't push him away. Oh no, instead, I closed my eyes and got carried away. I even lifted up one leg. Oh, and FYI, that was my first kiss. After that, we both turned bright red and avoided eye contact. Ugh, my whole body felt hot like I was having a fever or something. <laughs> anyway, the party was everything I dreamed of and more. The next day, Harry and I arrived at school in a super good mood. But suddenly, we saw a bunch of students gathering around someone. We squished through the crowd and saw Amanda crying. Turns out, somebody from the party had stolen two of her mom's Fabergé eggs. Then, one of Amanda's friends suggested checking all backpacks and lockers of everyone who went to the party last night. But the chances are low. The culprit must have been able to hide all the evidence by now. Still, we should try everything we can, right? I couldn't bear seeing Amanda crying her eyes out like this. Then he gently patted her shoulder. 
Hey, that was smooth. Way to go, Harry. And so, we checked a few people's belongings, and still nothing was found. Then it was Harry's turn. He opened the locker, and oh my god, one of the Fabergé eggs was in there. But how? He would never do such a thing. I opened my locker, and what? There was the other one! What on earth was going on? Suddenly, Amanda started shouting at us. I knew it was you two! Hey everybody, Emily over here manipulated Dustin by using his weaknesses, his love of soccer, and his dislike for math. Then she forced him to pretend to be her boyfriend just so she could be cool. Everybody started glaring at me like I was the villain, but I wasn't. There was a misunderstanding. I looked over to Dustin for help but he just avoided my gaze, then walked off. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there in shock until Harry dragged me off with him. Well, after that, I was more popular than ever. I was now known as the girl who took advantage of a guy to get popular and then stole from him. Worse, Amanda wouldn't listen to me. Harry and I were clearly framed. <sighs> I wish I could go back to my normal life before I made that stupid deal with Dustin. Oh, but then that kiss wouldn't have happened. Oh boy, might I have fallen for Dustin? Then suddenly I got a text from Amanda. It was a clip from the recent party with the message, You're nothing to Dustin. Why are you dating this loser? Wasn't she the girl who hiccuped during the play? <laughs> I will use her until the end of this semester. Oh my, I couldn't believe he said that. I knew he didn't like me in the way I liked him. But did he have to be so mean? The clip automatically replayed again. Ugh, watching this one time was bad enough. But wait, there was a detail in the clip that caught my attention. I rewound it and, oh my god, there were the two missing Fabergé eggs. The clip was recorded at midnight, but Harry and I left the party way before then. I quickly rushed over to Dustin and Amanda's house and showed them the video. I don't remember you both leaving earlier. What if you're lying? Well, I noticed your front door has cameras. If you want, we could check them. Dustin turned to Amanda and confusingly asked, Did you put those eggs in Emily and Harry's lockers? Amanda said nothing, but her head down said it all. But why would you do that? Emily didn't do anything wrong. Because I don't like her being your girlfriend. I, I like you. Um, what? Isn't she his sister? Oh, turns out they aren't actually siblings. Whew. That would have been weird. The truth is their parents were really close. And when Amanda's parents died in an accident, Dustin's family took her in. So Amanda was like a sister to Dustin, but Amanda, on the other hand, has been in love with him for a long time. I decided not to make a big deal out of it. As long as she posted a status on social media saying this was all a misunderstanding and that we didn't steal from her, and she reluctantly agreed. Afterward, I immediately got out of there without saying anything else to Dustin, but he ran after me and apologized for not defending me the other day. He just couldn't choose between me and Amanda. And then he said, That clip you saw wasn't what you think. Ugh. What's there not to understand? It was so obvious. Then what is it? Please tell me. But Dustin just stood there silent and stared down at his sneakers. Just like I thought. There's nothing else to explain, so I stormed off. The next day, Amanda posted the status, and our names were finally cleared. My life is back to being boring, but it's okay, as I now know that being popular isn't what brings me happiness. Oh, and about me and Dustin? Well, a few days later, he sent me a video. It was the same clip from the party. At first, this frustrated me. I mean, why would he make me endure watching that again? But then I noticed that this clip was longer, so out of curiosity, I pressed play. And you won't believe what happened in the second half of that video. After the part where Dustin said he just wanted to use me, everybody teased him more. He got angry and yelled. Yes, Emily is weird, but weird in a good way. I like the way she smells books every time she opens one, and the cute way she gets embarrassed when she sneezes loudly. And do you know what I like most about her? that she hiccups every time she's nervous. You heard me right, I like her. You see, Dustin likes me too. Amanda cut this part of the video out on purpose so I'd misjudge him. But now that I knew the truth, what do you think I did? Yeah, of course I forgave him. I mean, how couldn't I? <laughs> hmm, I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie?
Is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> the giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare. I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores, so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer... I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even... Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh! Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, what rotten luck. I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. It wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gopping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But a hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And, oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So, finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine, great even, until one day when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know, but it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, 
instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute. Well, he thought I was too skinny. <sighs> then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. <sighs> the plan was all ruined. So I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But, but how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist. But I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. I also changed water for milkshakes, but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang. I excitedly opened the door. But as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry. I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now, it doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. <sighs> so, it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. 
How ridiculous! You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh! How could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things, including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it, but on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk, and I was an idiot for ever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off. And worse still, she felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on, Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel, our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So don't ever let idiots put you down. Because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. How is it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance. Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his maids just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is. Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of ten feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and... His every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. 
clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there. And werewolves too. His horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta-da! I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but... Where is he? Should I... I open the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him. Still, he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly, his eyes opened. Hey, the ten-foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock. Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops. Awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. Wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph! Please don't do it! Ah, my arm! Realizing that he'd just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. 
He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster, just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we noticed a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta, with you by my side now, anything feels possible. I was completely immersed in this beautiful harmony that me and my dad were playing, until... What on earth are you two doing? Startled. I turned around to see Siren standing there with fiery eyes. Oh, God. I came back to my senses at once and realized that next to me, the man I was jamming with was not my dad, but Isaac, her boyfriend. Oh no, what had I done? I quickly wiped my tears away and was about to leave. But Isaac took my hand and gave me this confused look. Being back here in this house was difficult enough without getting involved in this love triangle. So I tried to pull my hand free and ran out of there. Yes, it's me again, Hazel. In the last part of my story, my friends embroiled me into helping their idol Isaac and his actress girlfriend Siren escape from the public eye for a bit. Now I'm stuck in my family's old home and having to confront my past. All these memories flooded my mind. Some good, some bad. And before I knew it, I was mixing the past with reality. And that's how I accidentally played the piano with Isaac and made Siren green with envy. At that moment, Siren swung open the door and charged toward me. Hey, don't let me catch you flirting with my BF again! Excuse me? What did you say? He's not even my type. Besides, having you as a love rival sounds like way more hassle than it's worth. She gave me this lingering scowl. Clearly she was furious with me, but she must have decided there was nothing else she could say on this matter. However, this didn't stop her from being the most demanding, frustrating diva on the planet. She stuck her nose up at the food and drinks we served her and insisted that she couldn't possibly consume anything that wasn't organic. She threw the clothes that we lent her down the stairs because, quote, those vulgar outfits didn't suit her. Then she asked Ivy to go get her designer ones. Once, Zoe even had to drive over an hour to the mall just for a few scented candles. Why, you ask? Well, 
Siren accused me of exuding this bad energy that had been affecting her sleep and her well-being, so she needed to cleanse the aura around here. Poof! This was nonsense. Once her head touched the pillow, she slept like a log. It seems that living in the same house as their idol and his girlfriend wasn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. Isn't that right, Ivy and Zoe? However, contrary to Siren the Nightmare, Isaac surprised me quite a lot by actually being a great help around the house. He was an excellent cook and a dab hand at fixing things. Okay, I admit that I used to think he was just one of those useless celebs out there, but it seems he had no problem with pulling his weight. Anyway, this manner of his did somewhat make up for the obnoxious attitude of his girlfriend, which made this whole thing a bit more bearable. Until this one time... We were rowing on the river near the mansion. Well, I was rowing, to be exact. Just me, as what could we expect from our two superstars? But it's pretty out here, isn't it? It was Siren's bright idea, as she wanted some new Insta photos. You're probably wondering where Zoe and Ivy are? Yep, they're scouring the shops a few towns over for ethical foie gras. Look at her, saying she's feeling sick she couldn't row but apparently she was well enough to smile for the camera and strike dozens of different poses. Suddenly, Siren decided to stand up to get better lighting, which made the whole boat shake. I shouted at her to sit down, but then before I properly knew what was going on, the boat was turning sideways and I tumbled into the water. I flailed my arms and legs out and tried my best to raise my head above the water, but it was no use. I couldn't stop myself from sinking beneath it. I honestly believed this was it. The world started to darken around me, when suddenly, an arm grabbed me and pulled me ashore. Hazel, can you hear me? I slowly opened my eyes and saw Isaac's worried face peering down at me. Hazel, thank goodness. He gently helped me sit up, then asked me if I was all right. For a few fleeting moments, the warmth from his body made me flush. Clearly, nearly drowning had made me delirious. I mean, I couldn't have feelings for him. Could I? Before I could ponder on this thought any more, a drenched siren dripped her way over to us. Isaac, why did you rescue her instead of me? Siren, this is not the time for being dramatic. I was hardly going to come to you, an expert swimmer, over Hazel who was actually drowning. Hearing Isaac say that, she rolled her eyes, then stormed off leaving a wet footprint trail in her wake. The last thing we needed in the house was more tension, so I immediately turned to him and said I was fine, and he should go and sort things out with his girlfriend. Listen, Hazel, Siren's not my girlfriend. I don't like her in that way, but as for you and me, we clearly have a connection. I stared at him in complete open-mouthed shock. Did he really just say that? Or... Perhaps I had a concussion and was imagining things. Siren's like my little sister. I'll explain this later, but first you need to rest. Then he wrapped his arms around me and guided me back to the house. I spent the rest of that day in bed feeling feverish. Then at dawn the next morning, I awoke to a commotion coming from downstairs. Guys? <sighs> What's all the noise about? It's Isaac and Siren! They've gone! and they've taken the car. What? That was our only mode of transport out of here. How could they be so selfish to just abandon us here like this? We tried contacting Isaac countless times, but no answer. Great, here we are now in this remote area where it would take hours to even find a passerby to hitchhike, not to mention how risky it'd be. Everything was a mess. We were panicking when suddenly the door burst open and walked in a smiling, arm-linked Isaac and Siren. Where have you been? You can't just leave like that without telling us. Oh, Ivy lent us the car. Didn't she say anything? Both Zoe and I turned our gazes on Ivy. She stammered. But, but I think you guys just went out for a while. Not disappeared all night unreachable. Relax. All this tension will give you wrinkles. Then Siren smirked at me as she flicked back her hair and then continued. We went to a drive-in cinema, and it was so romantic. We didn't want the evening to end, so we strolled around town until the early hours. What did she mean by that? So much for him seeing her as a sister. I felt like such a fool for believing his lies. 
We altered our entire plans to help you both hide from society, and this is how you thank us? By pulling a stunt like this? No more. Get out of here! Right now! Before anyone could say anything, my phone buzzed. It was my friend Erica. She asked me if the stories about me being in love with Isaac were true. Huh? What was she on about? In my panic, I ended the call and went online to check it out. Turns out on the Instagram account of the store where I customized our matching hoodies, the shop owner had posted a photo of me wearing it. Naturally, it didn't take the fan maniacs long to do their research and find out all about me. But worse still, another current trending post was one from Isaac's management company, confirming that we were officially dating. What kind of nonsense is this? I immediately told Isaac to call his company and put it on speaker. Isaac, we hit a jackpot! You probably know the iconic pianist and composer Edward Moretz, right? Hazel Moretz is his daughter! You... you mean... Everyone gasped at me in shock. Maybe it's time for me to reveal the secrets of my past, the truth that's been hidden for so long. Yes, Edward Moretz is my father, but I made a promise to myself ten years ago that I would never speak to him again. Isaac's manager continued to brazenly talk about how the scandal with me would benefit Isaac's career, so there was no need to hide it. At that moment, Siren shouted, What on earth are you saying? Hey, are you with Siren again? I already told you not to mess with that girl unless you want to get yourself in trouble. Shut up! Siren furiously grabbed Isaac's phone and ended the call. Isaac, tell everyone that the one you love is me! Not her! Siren, we were never in love. You're going too far. What? You guys aren't dating? So we misunderstood it all from the beginning? I knew right away there was something wrong. Yet you pretended to be his real girlfriend and treated us like your minions. Siren stood there with a red face, fists clenched. I gave you my heart, but all you do is hurt me. This time you've made a big mistake, Isaac. Just wait and see. Siren left for her room, but this time neither of us stopped her or comforted her. The next morning, we found out that Siren was gone. None of us knew where she was. We all just hoped that she wasn't so fueled with anger that she'd cause us even more problems. We quickly packed our things into the car, preparing to return to our normal life. When out of nowhere, a bunch of reporters and journalists appeared and surrounded us. Isaac, Miss Sirenwild has accused Ms. Moretz of wrecking your relationship. Is this true? Does that mean you ran away from all the shows to go on a secret date with Ms. Moretz? Ms. Moretz, your father was known for breaking not only yours, but also another family apart. All for his own selfish needs. Are you following in his footsteps? Scary flashlights were everywhere. Suddenly I found myself transported back to that terrible day ten years ago when Dad's affair went public and the reporters hounded us in this exact same spot. Those heartless flashlights are just as intense now as they were back then. A memory of my mom's distraught face popped into my mind. Puffy eyes, tear-stained cheeks, a fearful look. Yet the reporters were relentless vultures, firing questions at her regardless of her vulnerable state. That's the day I made a promise to myself that not only would I never pursue music, but I'd also never forgive my father. Amid the panic, an arm pulled me into the car, and we drove away from the crowd. It was Isaac. He put on some piano music to help calm me down, and he continued driving, eventually stopping at a small grocery store. Hazel, please drink this. Sorry for dragging you into all this. The thing is, I've been unhappy with my management company for a while now. They won't let me make the music I want to but I didn't expect them to go as low as forcing me into their web of lies just for fame. I know how you feel. I used to long to become a pianist like my dad, but then he crushed my dreams. To further his career, he cheated on my mom with another married woman and left our family behind. I grew to hate the complex world of artists. I vowed to never become one of them. And then I gradually began to despise the sound of the piano, too. I'm sorry to hear that story. But art isn't to blame. It reflects lies genuinely, doesn't it? I heard your piano melodies and you are truly gifted. Be honest with your feelings and don't let anyone else interfere with them. Trying to deny your own passion and emotions will only make you miserable. Isaac's right. 
I'd let my dad's mistakes alter the pathway to my dreams. Not making music made me miserable. It felt like there was a part of me missing, one that nothing else could fill. Why should I be the one to suffer like this, when it hadn't even been me that done anything wrong? Look at me now. Can you believe it? I've rekindled my passion for piano, and now I'm happier than ever. After all that runway pop star drama, Isaac left his management company and collaborated with me to make music for true art. This is our latest charity event. It's pretty neat, huh? That's all thanks to Zoe and Ivy. They work for us now. They're in charge of arranging our busy schedules and organizing our events. The four of us make the best team. I guess you're wondering what happened to Siren. Last I heard, she set her sights on her latest movie co-star. Hmm. Wish her good luck is all I can say. As for Isaac and me, well, since the media claimed that we were a couple, we might as well have turned that fake news into reality. Hey Beans, welcome back to my channel. I'm so cranked to introduce today's special guest, my daughter Elle. Say hi, sweetie. Hi, we're making butter from scratch today. I'm so excited. Elle, can you please do this properly? Mom, it's the sixth take already. I can't even film my arms anymore. If you're still not satisfied, then film it yourself. Hey, I'm Elle, a high school student living in Wisconsin with my mom. From the outside, there's nothing out of the ordinary about us. Well, except that my mom's a vintage-holic. See, she in fact became a famous YouTuber for her 1950s lifestyle. Living like this was such a hassle. But that's what puts food on our table, so I had to put up with it. However, sometimes mom even insisted that I join in her videos. Like today. Ugh. Not just that. Whenever we went out together, she made me wear the cheesiest vintage dresses, so I wouldn't ruin her aesthetic. As a hip-hop dancer, it was torture. See? I sure look way better in these clothes. Oh dear, what are those awful threats? Here, try this. It's really the bee's knees. Bee's knees, she said. More like granny. Ah, so pretty. Auntie, you have such excellent taste. That's Daisy, my cousin. And also schoolmate. Who gets along much better with my mom? Jeez, I can't let this hideous dress go home with us. If you like this so much, why don't you just take it instead, Daisy? Mom then walked to the counter with some more tacky clothes, ready to pay, but... Gee, where did I put it? <sighs> Guess I'll come back another time. Oh, missing something, Mommy? It's okay, Mrs. Faye. You're a regular, so you can pay us next time. Wait, what? No! So, now I had to wear this ugly dress to the boring event Mom was dragging me to. Because the more, the merrier. On the way there, Mom was talking a blue steak about how I should behave at the bash. When suddenly, huh? What now? Awesome! This must be the third time this hunk of junk has broken down this month. Isn't it fantastic? And we don't even have phones to call for help. Elle, I've told you. It'd be ridiculous to show up with smartphones while dressing like this. Besides, people used to live just fine without them. Stop relying on them so much. Trust me, some nobleman will soon come to our rescue. Stay here and wait all you want. I'm gonna go look for a garage. But I only managed a couple of steps before a fancy car pulled over, and an old man in a suit stepped out and offered to help. Turns out he's one of Mom's subscribers and even asked for a picture. Thank you so much for saving my chariot. You're the ginchiest. Gosh, here she goes again with her old-timey slangs. Eventually, we reached this Anceville, and as soon as we arrived, Mom immediately ran to her celeb friends and posed for photos, leaving me lost and confused. While I was trying to navigate through this madness, some whispering caught my attention. Isn't that Faye? She's so extra! I can't even get past the first five minutes of her videos! Oh yeah? And still, Mom thought the whole world was her fan. I don't get why she wanted to be here with these fake people that much! I was not having any of that stuffy place, so I went outside to get some air. As I wandered along the street, I spotted a group of teenagers Dancing to old school hip hop. This is right up my alley. But wait, ugh, this stupid dress. My jam is coming on though. So letting my adrenaline take over, I joined the crowd. Everyone seemed impressed and even made room for me to shine. Then one of them joined me. I was really feeling it when a familiar screeching voice startled me. Elle, what on earth are you doing? Agitate the gravel now. 
Then Mom dragged me to the car and drove me straight home. Gringles, do you understand that if anyone sees you like that, the perfect image I've built all these years will be in ruins? Pfft, then don't drag me into these things. Do it alone. Mind your manners. You should find something more practical rather than dancing like those good-for-nothing lazy bums. I'd had enough. Furious, I stormed into my room and stayed there all night. The next morning, I woke up to the rumbling sound of an empty stomach. When the coast was clear, I went downstairs to check the fridge for food. Ew, what's that rotten egg smell? Jesus, this fridge must be from Napoleon times! I reluctantly went for an instant soup, but the microwave wouldn't even heat it up. And guess what? My mom spent over $500 just for this thing's useless 50s look. Then I decided to put on a movie to blow off some steam. But the ancient TV wouldn't turn on either. Unbelievable! Is there anything in this rusty dollhouse that actually works? I need to get out of here before going insane. Oh, there's a new family moving in next door. Hang on, isn't that the guy I was dancing with last night? He smiled and waved at me, but I could only force a smile and nodded back. Hey, why the long face? If you're bored, come give me a hand. Then he dragged me over to his yard before I could reply. Once we're done, we rested on the front porch. Turns out his name was Royce. He'd just moved in with his dad and had enrolled at my school. I have to admit, he's quite the charmer. And within minutes, I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my unconventional life with mom. My mom has way too much free time. I wish she'd find a man. Only then she might quit nagging me. Meanwhile, my dad is always busy. If he had someone by his side, he'd want to spend more time with his family and be less of a workaholic. Wait a minute. So, how about we make them... A, a couple. couple! Today is the day. Our parents have really tight schedules, so planning out this date took a lot of effort. But so far, so good. I told my mom to check out this vintage-themed restaurant in town while Royce told his dad that he wanted some father-son bonding time. Then, oops, we accidentally bump into each other and join tables. Look at my mom, gracefully fixing her hair and acting all charming. <laughs> I winked at Royce and then we made an excuse to leave the table so the adults could have some private time. It's been a little while. Let's see how the two are doing. Goodness gracious, was Mr. Phillips slurping on the spaghetti? He's making a mess and Mom seemed really embarrassed. We immediately rushed inside to save this date before it's too late. At the end of the evening, we thought the worst was behind us. Mr. Phillips walked out without holding the door open for Mom, making it swing back in her face. Gosh. Every beginning is difficult, I guess. <sighs> Over the next few days, Royce and I beat our brains out to try and find a way to save their budding relationship, and came down to this. Mom, I twisted my ankle during practice. Can you please pick me up? Hey, Dad, I forgot my wallet at the practice room. Could you pick it up on the way home? Then we waited until our parents showed up and went inside to lock the door and even turn off the lights for dramatic effect. I immediately heard my mom's horrified scream. Then the room went quiet. I bet Mr. Phillips calmed her down. We waited a few minutes before calling the security guard to open the door. But contrary to our expectations, the one being hysterical was Mr. Phillips, who was now sobbing in my mother's arms. Wait, what? Turns out Royce forgot that his dad, who always sleeps with the light on, is in fact nyctophobic. There goes plan B. This was bad. Everything kept going south, and the clock was ticking as Royce's dad had to leave for another business trip soon. We can't accept defeat like this. There must be something your dad's really good at, right? I don't know. He's good at fixing stuff. Ha! <laughs> then we know what to do next. While Mom was taking a shower, I waited for my plan to set in motion. Three, two, one. Ah! Elle! Help me! I ran over to her to see water shooting out from a broken faucet. After a couple of minutes of struggle, I called Royce's house for help, aka Mr. Phillips. As soon as he arrived, he went straight into the bathroom and helped mom out of that pool. He looked way too cool, just like Superman. Now, time for his forte to speak up. As expected, he fixed it all in a blink, and mom even invited the two of them to stay for dinner as a thank you. Great! During dinner, Mr. Phillips kept praising my mom's cooking. He admitted that this coziness reminded him of the good old days. Seeing things escalate between them, Royce and I finished quickly and excused ourselves to give them some time alone. My dad's right. I can't remember the last time we sat together, as a family. 
Then he told me that his parents divorced a few years back, and due to his dad's work, they were always moving from place to place, which really wore him out. Seeing his sad gaze made me feel so bad for him. I just wanted to give him a hug. Hold on, what nonsense was I thinking? I immediately brushed off that weird thought, and we chatted until late. The next day at school, I was talking to Royce as usual, when suddenly our conversation was interrupted. Oh my god, aren't you the new guy? How do you know him? Huh? Where did Daisy come from? And is befriending Royce something strange? Then she whispered to me that Royce's good looks hadn't gone unnoticed by other students. Wow, no wonder I kept feeling like we were being watched whenever we hung out at school. Daisy then proceeded to chime in between us and talk to Royce non-stop, even on our way home, when clearly her house was not in the same direction as ours. How annoying! But good news, back at home, Mum seemed to be floating on air. I caught her humming along to love songs, and she didn't nag me at all when I went to dance practice. Royce also said that his dad had been in a great mood too. Sparks were definitely flying between them. Our plan finally worked. Good job, sis. Huh? huh? Was I really going to be his... stepsister? I should be happy with this outcome, right? But what was this uneasy feeling? One day at practice, I walked in on Daisy and Royce and immediately felt awkward, so I just rolled myself into a corner. Why did I react that way seeing them be so close? Is it possible that... I've fallen for him? This can't be. We're gonna be family. There's no way this can happen. After that day, I tried to avoid Royce. Despite his new girl, he still bothered me, but I kept my distance. I was brooding all the way home, until I heard my mom talking on the phone as I entered the house. And I'll bake you some pecan pie, darling. Wait a minute, Royce and his dad were both allergic to pecan, so who's she being all lovey-dovey with? The next day, as usual, I told my mom I'd go to practice, but actually lingered outside the house to stalk on mom. I saw her on the couch, video calling some strange man. Oh gosh, did my mom really cheat on Royce's dad? How could she? Still in shock, I glumly lurked to Graffiti Alley and spotted Royce and Daisy there. They seemed to be talking about something really serious. So, you already knew? Yeah, ages ago, but it's clear that we can't just force love on someone. So, you mean to just give up and happily watch them see other people? Oh no, so they knew Mom was unfaithful to Mr. Phillips already? How embarrassing! Right at that moment, Daisy spotted me, so I frantically ran away. After school the following day, Daisy wanted to talk with me in private. However, it was not about what happened yesterday. Do me a favor and stop hovering around Royce all the time, will you? But Royce is my friend. I can't just stop seeing him because you said so. If you like him, be my guest. Suddenly, Daisy fell to the ground. Ouch! Why did you push me? Huh? What is she doing? At that exact moment, Royce showed up and worriedly checked on her. Okay, now I know what's going on. Sorry about that. Let me give you a hand. When she was just about to stand up... I shoved her. Now you know what my real push feels like. I noticed Roy's stunned look, but just walked off. Now that I don't seem so great in his eyes anymore, he'll stop approaching me. Sweetie, what's wrong? What's wrong? This is all your fault. If you didn't cheat on Mr. Phillips, everything would be fine. What do you mean? Cheating on whom? Then my mom burst out laughing after I told her. Turns out they never dated. They both saw through our matchmaking plan early on, but decided to just be good friends. And the person I saw mom video calling with was her boyfriend, but she hadn't introduced him yet because they'd only started dating. But why set us up in the first place? Finally, I had the chance to tell her how I truly felt about being forced into her vintage world and not being able to pursue my love for street dancing. Mom was quiet for a second and then said, Gee, how silly I've been. I've been inspiring strangers to go after their dreams, but I stopped my own daughter from pursuing hers. I felt so much better after pouring my heart out. I also mentioned Royce's situation with his dad, and she promised to talk to him about it. Hang on. This means... Mom, so you and Mr. Phillips are just friends, right? Immediately, I ran off to find Royce. As if on cue, the doorbell rang, and it was... Daisy! What game is she playing now? If she's here to mess around, come at me already. But surprisingly, Daisy apologized. I'm sorry, I was just blinded by jealousy. And there is nothing going on between me and Royce. He in fact already rejected me the day you saw us at the graffiti alley. Also, he asked me to give you this. I opened the box to see an adorable keychain with I love you on it. Oh my, is, is this a love confession? 
But there's also a note saying, I'm leaving for another city. Till we meet again. No, no, no! I sprinted to his house right away. Oh lord, he's already packing! Without thinking, I hugged him and started sobbing. So, you read my message? Y yeah And what do you think? I- I feel the same, but you're leaving for real? Then, his smile turned playful, and he admitted he was just messing with me. Turns out he was going away, but only for a few days, for a dance competition. Really? That's awesome! But I can't forgive you for tricking me yet. So, yeah. Although we couldn't get our parents together, us two actually became a couple, so our matchmaking scheme isn't a total failure, right? <laughs> we were even able to change a few things for the better. For instance, Mom spoke to Royce's dad, and he agreed not to move for the time being so his son could settle in. Mom also promised to check in on him when his dad's away on business. As for our family, my mom no longer tried so hard to act like she's not living in 2023. She now sometimes includes modern elements in her vlogs as well, and I even become a regular guest on her channel. Hey Beans, today my fiancé and I are baking this fab coconut cake, along with my daughter and our boyfriend. They are hip-hop dancers! Check out their channel if that's something you fancy! They're really the cat's pajamas! Augustine and I almost took down this fake Roblox plushie smuggling empire when the gang leader suddenly turned vigilant and ordered his members to arm lock us. Pablo, you got it all wrong! We're here to make a business deal! You don't fool me, you sneaky little rats! Think you can catch me? I am invincible! Mwahahaha! <laughs> Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Pizza's here! Please take your order! Did any of you morons order pizza? S sorry, boss, I, I did. I was starving. Please, could I have a bite quickly before executing these snakes? Go get the door, you dumbo! You, hands over your head. Pablo then came, hide behind the door, as it opened, and standing there was Jane! Hi, lunchtime! Jane then pulled up her skirt slowly, revealing her stocking. While the gang were dumbfounded, Augustine quickly restrained the gang member, while Jane slammed the door onto Pablo. And me? I stomped onto the guy's foot, elbowed him in the face, and pinned him on the ground. Phew, all hail Queen Jane! Hi, my name is Naomi, a special agent, and these are my partners. Augustine and Jane. With Augustine as leader, we three have successfully cracked the hardest cases, including this one. Augustine is such a respectable senior agent to me, while Jane is actually my annoying stepsister slash partner. It's your turn to write Pablo's case report. Don't push it onto me. Why do you always try to get away with tasks? Just like how you made me do all the dishes at home all the time, too. Team, we got a new case. Amy, straight A student. Lawrence High's representative to the upcoming United Nations event. Missing since Monday. Urgent request from parents and the school to bring the subject back safely. Suspect number one, Shirley. Direct competitor for the school representative title. A mean girl in disguise. So, starting tomorrow, we'll be students at Lauren High to investigate it. Can I join the girl posse and befriend Shirley? Nothing helps spilling the tea easier than blending in with the gossip girls. Okay, but we also got Diane, Amy's stepsister. Quiet and shy. Parents are freaking out and asking her to be watched 24-7 too. Jane, what do you think? I can approach Diane and keep an eye on her. Great. Remember team, do not act by yourself under any circumstance. Lawrence High, I'm coming for you. On the first day of school with my excellent disguise, I confidently strode to the classroom. My mean girl covers quickly got everyone's attention, including this guy. Hey cutie, let me show you around, and you can show me the way to your heart. Marco, Lawrence High's jock with a notoriously long list of ex-girlfriends. Meanwhile, Augustine's also taking a good chunk of the ladies' hearts, including Shirley's, my target. So, I purposely walked past her, showcasing my $200,000 Hermes bag, and... Hey, you! Yes, take the bait, fishies. You seem to have a sensible fashion style. Wanna join our group? Sure, I'm Naomi. Right then, Jane passed by. In the shy, nerdy girl covers, of course. Hold on for a second, rookie. Did you borrow your granny's dress for school? Right, Naomi? I... I think... Oh, this hurts my eyes too. Who in God's name wears pastel pink in 2023? Shirley and her entourage were cackling, while Jane gave me a hostile look and stormed off. Oh, please. She didn't have to take it so personally. She should thank me for that instead as now she can naturally be friends with Diane too. Since then, I started hanging around with Shirley and the girls. They love gossiping, which is indeed pointless, until the topic of Amy came up. Have guys seen Amy around at all recently? Amy, who on earth? 
Amy Hayward, the one competing against you for the school's representative. Oh, that stupid contest. I couldn't care less about it, actually. Thank God it's over. I only joined it because my dad kept insisting. Shirley didn't even remember Amy, nor did she want to compete with her. And now that I've noticed, she's boisterous at times, but actually quite straightforward. My guts are telling me it's not her. So I brought up my concerns about the case at our next meeting. I'm pretty sure Shirley is clear. What? Do you even think before saying? She's our number one suspect. Plus, from what Diane told me, she's always picking on other students. Yeah, but that doesn't mean she has ill intentions towards Amy. You need to stop judging people too quickly. <laughs> Excuse me? How about you stop siding with the devils? Or you find it hard because you're one too? Enough. Let's just keep your assumptions on hold for now. We need more clues before acting on anything. Dang it. If only I got some solid evidence. Jane just always slowed down the investigation, so the next day I went to find Diane myself to ask some more questions about Amy, but Marco stopped me with a bunch of roses? Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Be my girl, will you? I was still processing this when Augustine came from afar and went straight into the roses. Oops, sorry, I had my sunglasses on. Marco looked like an erupting volcano while Shirley gave an earth-shaking squeal. Eee! Oh, that body and that grace. Oh, great lord, please spare me. During independent reading, Marco and his army came marching toward Augustine to pick a fight. But Augustine completely ignored Marco, which infuriated him even more. Hey, you! Turn your coconut head around and have some courage to face me. Augustine calmly stood up returned his book as if Marco was invisible, and came to ask me to have lunch with him? He pulled me out of there, leaving Marco behind, grunting like a mad pig. It feels good living student life and having the boys chasing after you. Stay away from those teenage boys from me, will you? I don't see why. Don't get your identity revealed. Don't worry, and Marco's such a kid, not my type. By the way, you want to experience a heartfelt infatuation too? Think Shirley is laying an eye on you. The look on his face is priceless. <laughs> Who would have thought this charismatic agent is actually allergic to girls? During PE, I saw Shirley purposefully tripped and fell in the direction of Augustine, but ended up on the floor instead. Augustine then dashed over to me for help when Marco stopped him midway. Still holding grudges with Augustine, Marco announced a dodgeball war. Oh boy, didn't know what he got himself into. Augustine is our top agent. He dodged every single bullet aimed at him, let alone these plain red balls. In return, Augustine gave Marco one hit of a lifetime that knocked him down on the ground. Lucky for him, Diane was nearby and kind enough to give him a hand. Still, Marco gave the biggest grin when he spotted me and headed over to hand me a piece of paper. Will you go out with me? What a loser. He must have taken a new interest in you, Naomi. Rumor had it he asked Amy out, but then she went missing. Probably that poor girl couldn't handle him. <laughs> Marco met up with Amy before she went missing. Uh-oh, he's our number one suspect now, not Shirley. I eagerly updated Augustine and Marco. I have a feeling Marco knows something about the case that might lead us to Amy. I was thinking I could pretend to go on a date with him. That's too dangerous. What if he's behind it all? You might get into trouble, Naomi. No worries, he seems really into me. He asked Amy out and she went missing right after. Who knows what could happen to you? But he's the only lead we have now. Shirley is already out of the picture, and I know how to protect myself if anything happens. Please. And yes, the time has come for me to end this case. During the date, Marco was so caring, but I was dying to know what happened to Amy that day. So, I heard you and Amy were a thing before? Nah, we never got together. How can you be so perfect? Are you an angel? I heard otherwise. Rumors had it you even went out with her. Let's just focus on us, why don't you? But I want to know more about you, too. Fine, fine. If you want to know it that bad, I did ask her out, but I never saw her that day. Her sister showed up instead, sat there at a reserve table, and said something about Amy wouldn't be around for a while. I thought they wanted to mess with me, so I just left. Diane knew Amy would disappear even before she went missing? Did Diane have anything to do with this? She might have been the very piece we'd overlooked from the beginning. I got to the office and saw Augustine fidgeting around. Are you okay? Did Marco do anything to you? I'm fine. And I got the biggest news. I then told Augustine and Jane everything and posed my doubts for Diane. Why Diane? She's just a vulnerable victim who gets picked on all the time. And you know by who? Shirley. 
She might appear vulnerable, but who knows what she's got inside. And you remember how she came to help Marco up that time? Now that I think about it, she was so worried for him. She obviously likes Marco. It's possible she might get jealous of her sister. Oh, stop. Not everyone is a jello like you. What? Team, this is getting nowhere. For now, let's just agree on keeping Diane close. Again, no one is to act by themselves. A jello? Just watch me nail this case before you do, Jane. The next morning, I saw Diane secretly watching Marco play basketball. I swear to God, Diane is definitely into him and involved in her sister's missing. But Augustine wouldn't let me do anything. That'd leave me with the only option, which is to keep Diane's activities on watch. Indeed, she's been acting very strange lately. She received regular phone calls and would get out of class, just to return with a troubled face. I decided to tail her that afternoon. She looked very suspicious and kept turning around to check if anyone was following her. She's definitely hiding something. We were walking for quite some time, passing a vast area of abandoned field crops, until she stopped in front of a shabby house. This is clearly not a building for residency. The whole place looked so torn apart, and even had traps everywhere. Thank God I had all that training back in the academy to spot these deadly traps. Suddenly, I saw a flashing shadow sprinting right across the room. I quickly followed and saw a door leading to the dark basement. Diane, or whoever was staying here, is not going to be simple to deal with. Oh no, it's a trap! If you dare move an inch, you're done. Now tell me, who are you? Are you from the Dixie Mafia trying to get back at me? Mafia? N no, you got it wrong. I, I came to check on the electricity for this building. Please calm down. She's lying again, Mr. Gordon. I knew she was up to no good. Speak now if you want to stay intact. Oh no, no, no. I should have listened to Augustine and not let my stupid adrenaline take over. Is this the end of my mission? The end of my life? Suddenly, there was a loud banging sound. FBI, don't you dare touch her! It's Augustine! FBI? What? No! No, what's happening? Are you not from the gang? Jane was there for me too. She quickly took the bomb remote and turned it off. Fake bomb. Are you kidding? I quickly got out of the trap safely. Special Agent Naomi Cooper, where are you hiding Amy? No, no, you got it all wrong. Mr. Gordon's Amy's biological father. How can he hurt her? I looked at Augustine and Jane, who were as shocked as I was. Mr. Gordon used to work for the gang, but he turned his life around. That's why he thought you were the old gang, coming at him for revenge. Not long ago, he contracted a serious illness that needs a kidney transplant, and Amy is the only relative he's got left. You're telling me Amy agreed to give him a kidney? Then why are you here in the dark? Why hide? Because Amy's mom hated me and forbade me from seeing her, let alone giving me a whole kidney. But Amy is my daughter with a golden heart, even though I didn't want to. She insisted on giving me her kidney so I could live on. If mom knew about it, she would never agree. That's why Amy had to run away to have the transplant done with Mr. Gordon. Where is she now? Resting in that room. Don't worry, Mr. Gordon has been taking well care of her. Meanwhile, I helped bring them food and necessities. I quickly kicked the door open and saw Amy lying on the bed. What was all the commotion, Diane? Did you bring dad some squash? Augustine, Jane, and I saw it through now. We all got it wrong this whole time. The next day, we went to find Amy's mother and had a talk with her. She was shocked at first, but after knowing everything, she realized how wrong it was to separate father and daughter. She was so touched by her daughter's precious heart and agreed to let Amy come visit Mr. Gordon from now on. Looking at the sisters makes me think about my own sis. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. We gave each other a tight hug. We are sisters too in the end. Well, case closed. Let's go for some grand celebration, shall we? Actually, I have a date now. Why don't you take Naomi with you? Then she just left us there, cheeky Jane. I'm so relieved you're okay, Naomi. Because if anything happens to you... Yeah, Augustine? If anything happens, I would die for you. My most precious timekeeper. There's a saying that goes, when you fully trust someone without any doubt, you'll either have a person for life or a lesson for life. You bet I learned a valuable lesson because that quote manifested itself into my life. It was the summer of 2000, before our beloved smartphones and social media even existed. Elio, Tara, and I were exploring the glorious Barcelona. Spain was our first stop on our trip across Europe to celebrate high school graduation. That's 18-year-old me. I'd always wanted a partner who I could trust with my life and stick with me through thick and thin. But the boys I dated were too childish or selfish to be considered trustworthy. Except for my sweet Elio. He's always so attentive and cared for me greatly. But somehow, he couldn't ease my anxiety. At the beginning, I wanted us to have a couple's trip. 
But then I decided to have my only friend, Tara, join us, just to be safe. My treat, of course. Only Tara stayed friends with me after many other greedy leeches tried latching onto me for my family's wealth. Sure, I got you, girl. I was thinking you might just chicken out without me. Ha ha ha. She knew me too well. And so our journey began. Why Barcelona, you asked? Because I wanted to connect to my Spanish roots since my grandparents met then got married over there. Hopefully, Elio and I would be just like them. After weeks of sampling Michelin restaurants, five-star hotels, and high-end nightclubs, we visited Las Ramblas Market. And so did dozens of other tourists. Ugh, are they not seeing me intentionally? I can't suffocate between sweaty people, so I let us out of the crowd. Here comes fresh air. But hey, where are Tara and Elio? I reached for my phone and suddenly remembered that Elio had my handbag. My whole life's in there. My phone? My money? My passport? Ah, police! Officer! Officer, please help! I'm lost and I don't have my documents on me! But why did they keep dashing their gaze to me, then to each other? Oh, they understood me. Then they signaled me to follow them, probably to the police station. What? This is a hospital. They think I'm nuts? No, this isn't happening. What do I do? Uh, excuse me, you need help? That snapped me out of the panic attack. I turned around and saw two male supermodels. My, my. Hang on, time and place, Michaela. Turns out the guy who just approached me was Guzman. He's quite fluent in English and very friendly. Meanwhile, the cold one was Manu, who seemed to be watching me like an alien. I told him about my situation, then they led me to the U.S. Embassy. Luckily, they stayed to help me talk to the embassy staff, who I totally believe is the sloth from Zootopia in disguise. One eternity later, they said they'd help me find Elio and Tara, but it'd take several weeks. Ugh, that's it? What about me? I already told them I had neither money nor passport, right? Where do I stay? How would I survive? Right then, Guzman offered me to stay at his place and work at his family's restaurant in the meantime. Huh? Isn't that too generous to a stranger like me? These two beautiful and helpful people could be baits, but without any other option, I had to cautiously follow them. This was the first time I ever had to be on my own in a strange place, and the fact that their home was an old, slightly shabby restaurant didn't help. Mr. and Mrs. Rios, the owners, aka their parents, welcomed and fed me. I wasn't sure if the food was poisoned or not, but my rumbling tummy convinced me to blindly trust them for now. Then they showed me my room. That's nice. Perhaps a bit too nice, especially to a complete stranger. Am I going to get kidnapped like when I was five? If it wasn't for my bodyguard, I'd be living in a human trafficker's wonderland now. This room's only secured by a simple slide bolt, so I used all my strength uh, to barricade the door uh, with this wardrobe. Whew, that'll do it. I couldn't sleep much and got up pretty early, but it took me a while to remove my barricade and get downstairs. Ugh, scratch that. Or I might give myself scoliosis. At breakfast, they asked me how I was doing. I could only mutter a few Spanish phrases from school and prayed for my Spanish ancestors' assistance while their replies were too fast for me to comprehend. Besides, it sounded like they used a different language to communicate. Sensing my confusion, Guzman explained that people in Barcelona speak Catalan in their everyday life, not standard Spanish. Oh, right. Suddenly, I felt so alone among them. Unsurprisingly, when they opened, I was assigned dishwashing duty and organizing the storage room because I didn't speak any Catalan. Back home, I had maids and servants pick up after my every step. Literally. So working here was torture. Not to mention the hot weather here was draining me. My slow pace earned me Manu's glare, his annoyed frown, or sometimes a few words that I'm sure weren't very nice. Fortunately, Guzman was there to be the usual comic relief. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Tenada, you're doing your best, girl. Don't worry about that grumpy cat. Still, Manu was just one of my many problems. Everything seemed confusing, from how they tell the time to the metric system. Not to mention, mealtimes in Spain were always somehow two hours late. I swear, I almost blacked out from hypoglycemia the first few days. But today, Manu suddenly demanded I take a table's order. Maybe they sensed my nervousness, so they pointed at the dish they wanted from the menu. Gazpacho and pesto pasta? Got it! Call me Bear Grill. Improvise, adapt, overcome is the way to go. A while later, I was just vibing in the kitchen when I heard a commotion outside. I ran out and realized the customer from before was coughing violently. What's happening to him? 
I saw Mr. Rios ran up to his date, asked a few questions, and checked his half-eaten pasta. His face suddenly turned pale, and he immediately called an ambulance. Michaela, did you, by any chance, not hear that he said he had a nut allergy? Perhaps. He told me his food should be nut-free because he's allergic, but that went over my head. Thank God the ambulance arrived on time, so he was okay. Still, Mr. Rios had to apologize, and that meal was on the house. And me? Manu gave me a piece of his mind. Why is he angry at me? He knew I didn't speak their language, yet he made me take their order. I wish I spoke Catalan so I could fire him instantly. Guess I'll have to fire him myself. Adios. I was walking around aimlessly when Manu and Guzman found me. They said they were looking for me everywhere. Manu's awkward expression was very unlike his usual cool appearance. Sorry, you not know Catalan, I not know English. We, um, misunderstand. Go home, please, okay? Now I knew this guy seemed cold only because he didn't speak English. Seeing their sincerity, I followed them back. But will I ever return home? What if I'll never see my friends and family again for the rest of my life? The next day, I went to the U.S. Embassy and received shocking news. Elio and Tara not only had already left Barcelona, but Spain. A week ago. Why didn't you inform me immediately when you found them? Oh, we were going to do that tomorrow. They're gone anyway. <laughs> What's so funny about that, you moron? Never mind. Burning this place down wouldn't solve anything. My world had already collapsed. What did I do to deserve this? Why am I surrounded by cruel people? My paranoia was proven right once again. I can't trust anyone but myself. I relayed the news to the Rios and asked if I could live with them longer. They reassured I could stay as long as I needed. They can't reach you now either. They couldn't have abandoned you. Maybe they were looking for a way to help you. Chin up, Queen. Your tiara is gonna fall. This family's hospitality and positive energy are unmatched. Still, it saddened me that I couldn't return home just yet. A few days later, surprisingly, Manu offered me Catalan lessons. In return, I shall teach him English. He was a natural. I, on the other hand, felt like I was born with a wrong tongue. Whenever Manu got mad at me for making mistakes, I'd bombard him with questions as a distraction. Why do you use Celsius and not Fahrenheit here? Why Catalan and not Spanish? And what's up with siesta? I swear, it's like the entire city suddenly drops dead in the middle of the day. At first glance, my questions seemed to annoy Manu, but he actually answered all of them. I could see his iciness slowly melting. Time passed and my Catalan improved. Today, I even chatted with Manu's parents while working. They said this restaurant was established a few generations ago, and many troubled couples stopped by this place. But love always prevails in the end because our food heals them all. Might sound romantic, but actually, that's because great-granddad liked being a love guru, while great-grandma wished to be a couple's therapist. Since then, thanks to Manu and my co-workers, my life got a lot easier. Every time I messed up something, they'd offer help or guidance. One time, I got lost while delivering food and was gone for a long time. But when I got back, they didn't criticize me. One of them even joked that I didn't know the area because I rarely went out. So, Guzman suggested we three go to the beach after work. Some vitamin C sounds like what I need. Huh? But only Manu was waiting for me after our shift. It's uh, just us. Guzman's with his hot date. Guzman, you cheeky little schemer. Still, this isn't a date, right? Just two friends getting to know each other. I initially thought we're going to walk along La Rambla and arrive at Barceloneta Beach, but Manu took me to Playa Badalona, which was a bit further away, but pretty much empty and splendid. Strange how TripAdvisor didn't mention this place. Manu brought out a bottle of cava, a Barcelona specialty. Wow, isn't it expensive? Are you sure I can have this? You worked hard and deserve to play hard. Aw, so thoughtful. He might make me blush. Then we toasted to my chaotic arrival here. Mmm, that's the stuff. With Manu, I got to see an ordinary side of Barcelona. Not often do I get the chance to be somewhere this beautiful. I should be more adapting. Besides, if I wasn't here, I'd never get to observe this magnificent monument up close. Leave room for Jesus! Jesus! I mean, Guzman? He had a terrible date and came to vent. What were you thinking, Michaela? You have a boyfriend, remember? Eventually, my life here got more enjoyable. 
I kind of adopted the manana mentality, so taking it slow became my motto. I now realized whoever invented siesta was a genius. People would sometimes burst into songs, as others would either sing along or dance to the music. Spaniards seem to value quality of life more than those in the States. Speaking of which, I still got homesick from time to time, and Manu's the only one who seemed to notice. You can talk to me anytime. Rest assured, we're all happy to have you here. Okay, okay, I might have a teeny tiny crush on him. No, focus, Michaela. Think about Elio, your boyfriend. I wonder how he and Tara were doing. Speak of the devil, I saw them again that evening on a TV show about tourism in Marseille, France. And they shamelessly claimed to be a couple. I couldn't believe it. However, without my passport, I couldn't get to them. So I asked Manu and Guzman to go there, and they agreed. Girl, don't worry. I'm more than happy to bring those traitors to justice on your behalf. No matter what had happened, I'll be eternally grateful to them. My guardian angels. They returned after a couple of days with my stuff. But Manu said those two show no remorse as they put all the blame on me. The moment I saw them, I knew those two were backpacking. Trust me, honey. They're penniless. But I still had questions. So I immediately called Tara and chaos ensued. Tara said my paranoia and stubbornness tired her out, as they did Elio. We kept it to ourselves all this time because we didn't want to hurt you. But actually, it felt like a relief to not have you around. Did you know that we bonded over shared trauma? That's you. Good. I hope you two are happy asking strangers for money together. Tara, are you talking to Michaela? Mickey, wait. I can't listen to another word. There wasn't even any tears left in me. Manu sat down next to me. Hey, you got rid of those traitors. Why the long face? I'm fine. Don't mind me. I just lost the only two people I trust outside my family. No biggie. Come now, it's not that bad. Give up! What the? Oh, oops, my bad. Don't give up. Uh, I mean, cheer up. <laughs> Don't laugh. I, I mean it. Since you got here, you've become a lot more uh, independent, haven't you? You're quite a strong, resilient girl. He's right, and not just because I like him. I'd been so caught up in everything that I didn't realize I'd been entrusting my life to him, who I barely knew. I'd been relying so much on him and his family. Maybe it's not so bad knowing good people still exist. And this guy, he makes it so hard for me to leave this place. At the crack of dawn, I woke up to the deafening sound of helicopters? That's my family crest. My parents must have sent those choppers. A swole guy in black came up to me and said my dad wanted me home because I'd gone AWOL for far too long. Then he just grabbed me and we flew straight back to America. I begged him to turn around so I could say goodbye to Manu, Guzman, Mr. and Mrs. Rios, my saviors. But my pleading was completely ignored. I was finally home and went to college, but as a different person, I was determined to socialize more and befriend new people. And no, it's not just talks. I actually moved into the dorm to be surrounded by my peers. It's been a long time coming, but I learned to open up and keep my trust issue in check. I shouldn't pass up on companionship out of irrational fears. However, I couldn't take my mind off Manu. We didn't even properly say goodbye and had no way to contact one another. So I went back to Barcelona to look for him. But when I got there, his family said he'd just gone to the airport. Turns out, he went looking for me, too. I immediately got in a taxi and headed to the airport. As soon as I arrived, I saw the earliest flight to America had already taken off. That's how my time abroad wrapped up. Michaela, mi amor, where are you? Yes, my love. That photo album again. I'm right here, eyes on me. Well, I couldn't figure out why you didn't board that flight. I just had a feeling that I'd see you again if I turned around. Call it telepathy. So, this is the Roomba Club. Hmm, why isn't the guy here? Was I wrong? No way, I did lots of digging. Oh, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not a stalker. I'm just doing my job. It's obvious that there is something fishy about this case. Want to know the details? Please like and subscribe. I'm Faith McKinnon, the only daughter of a private detective. That probably sounds cool, but my dad is actually really carefree. Maybe that's why he only took on enough trivial cases to make ends meet. I haven't always paid much attention to his business, though. I mainly focus on studying, so our future can be brighter. What? What are you saying, sir? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm in. You can count on me. Faith, I just got a big job. A customer had paid him handsomely to investigate this case. A girl named Selena Martinez just had an accident and fell into a coma. But there was no CCTV on the road, and the heavy rain erased all traces. The police couldn't find any evidence, so they concluded that it was a traffic accident. But Mr. and Mrs. Martinez didn't believe it and suspected her boyfriend, Oscar Davis, was involved. Thus, they had to rely on my detective dad. Ha <laughs> ha, looks like folks need my help after all. Me, McKinnon, can solve any case. Conveniently, those two kids go to the same school as me, so Dad asked me to keep an eye on them. Okay, nothing complicated, so I agreed. That's why I'm here. I heard Oscar loved Roomba and never missed a class, but why hasn't he shown up today? I was looking around when a hand patted my shoulder. What are you doing? <gasps> Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Oh my, am I dead? Because I swear I'm seeing an angel. Look at his eyelashes framing those beautiful hazel eyes in that super touchable long dark hair. Hey, you still with me? Are you here to join our Roomba squad, princess? If so, you're looking at the right person. I'm Zane, head of this club. Uh, yes, I'm Faith. I love Roomba. Well, joining this club will surely help me with my mission, won't it? But I knew absolutely nothing about this Roomba dance thingy. Gosh, how could they dance with those heels so freaking high? I tried to copy other students, but my legs were just not listening, causing me to stumble. And luckily, Zane caught me just in time. Are you good? Let me show you some basics before you hurt yourself or someone else. Then Zane took me aside, and we started to dance with his arms wrapped around my waist. With each twirl, I felt like he was pulling me closer and closer, and I couldn't stop blushing. Was Roomba supposed to always be like that? Then our eyes met. His gaze was so soft and dreamy and angry. Zane stopped in the middle, and his face darkened. Right at the door was Oscar! Zane immediately dragged him outside. I sneakily followed them to see they were quarreling at a corner. Drop your act already. Let me see, Selena. Please. You have some nerve asking to meet my sister after what you did to her. How many times do I need to tell you that I had nothing to do with her accident? Keep lying all you want, but I'll find evidence. You'll soon have to pay for what you did. Zane was Selena's brother? That meant we were on the same boat. The investigation could have been going much more smoothly if I'd known this earlier. I went straight to Zane, saying, Selena Martinez was your sister? Yeah, why are you- I'm helping to investigate her accident. Oh, really? Zane was surprisingly cooperative in helping me answer some questions for the investigation. My parents just can't help but suspect Oscar had something to do with it. He's kind of obsessed with our Selena. She'd rejected him many times, but he wouldn't stop pining for her. And eventually she gave in. But that only kicked in his possessive behaviors. He bought gifts and controlled what she wore every day. He followed my sister everywhere, even to the restroom to make sure she's safe, and climbed to her window to check her sleep every night. Jeez, that's crazy. Selena was having too much and decided to end things with him for good. But after that, she was found unconscious in an accident. It can't be a coincidence. I'm sure Oscar's obsession has turned into rage. Wow, it really was impossible to judge someone just on appearances. Oscar looked so nice, yet... To gather more information, I asked around about Oscar and Selena. Selena used to be kind of mean, but ever since she and Oscar became an item, she's like another person. Much kinder and nicer, I would say. Yeah, they were really sweet together. I was surprised to hear she broke up with him. Huh? Sweet? Are they talking about another Oscar? I even went to Oscar's neighbors and discovered that his mom was the head of the Medical and Pharmaceutical Association. All I heard were good things about him. Oh, that sweet boy. He always runs right out to help me carry groceries. He even gave me his phone number to call him when I need help. Oscar is a real good kid. Every year on Halloween, he decorates a whole haunted house for the neighborhood kids and stays out there until every last trick-or-treater leaves with a sack full of candy. Things are getting way confusing. It's like Zane and the others were describing two totally different people. Why are you following me? I looked up to see Oscar. I, I, I'm not. I tried to run, but he grabbed me. Please don't lie to me. I know why you're here, and I want to cooperate. Because I too want this all to be over quickly. Only then can I see Selena again. Okay, I should give him a fair chance and make my own judgments about this guy. And I'm also really curious to hear his side of the story. 
I used to be picked on pretty often, until Selena started standing up for me. She was truly my knight in shining armor, <laughs> and that's when I knew I'd fallen in love with her, and she actually liked me back. And that's when she came to do charity work with me for the first time, and we happened to meet in the Roomba Club and become partners. We were happy in love. Selena even bought me gifts and planned surprise dates. Things were good. Great, actually. But suddenly she broke up with me, then got into the accident. I just really want to see if she's okay. This guy seemed very sincere. A bit silly, even. He couldn't be the one who could scheme such a hateful plan, could he? But why does nothing match what Zane told me earlier? One of them must be lying. But who? Things were becoming perplexing. But that evening, when I got home, my dad told me that he had found a dash cam from another car, which filmed the moment Oscar's car hit Selena's. Case closed. Who would have thought a $15,000 case like this could be solved so easily? I'm such a genius. <laughs> With this pace, I'd be a millionaire before you knew it. Huh? That's it? No, something didn't add up here. My gut was telling me that Oscar the Sim couldn't be the cunning and ruthless mastermind behind all this. The next morning, I was startled by Dad's loud excitement. I'm on a headline, baby! Turns out the video had spread like wildfire on the news. But that's not all. Another part of the story was also revealed. Oscar, Dr. Davis's son, loved Selena Martinez but was rejected, so he threatened to tell his mom to cancel their new medicine's license. Selena still resisted him, so her family lost the medicine's permit and suffered great damage. Meanwhile, Oscar got so mad that he caused the accident. So there's some family conflict involved too, not just teenage love? Seeing loads of angry comments, I was so worried that I immediately ran to the Roomba Club to find Oscar. There, I found Zane grabbing Oscar's collar. I always know it's you. How are you going to deny it now? Wait, stop! Upon seeing me, Zane loosened his fists. You're going to pay for this. I swear I didn't do it, Faith. I don't know where that video came from. Please help me. I also felt things couldn't be that simple, so I came home to check the video again. Finally, I found something that was off. If the impact happened at that angle, Selena's left arm would have been injured, but it wasn't, according to the hospital's record. Dad, I think the video of the accident was fabricated. We need to confirm Selena's condition before making any conclusion. Well, this case is already closed. The Martinez family asked me to wrap it up as soon as the evidence was discovered. Why such a hurry? They spent all this money but didn't want a thorough investigation? The next day, I decided to investigate myself. I disguised as a nurse to sneak into the hospital, but Selena's room was strictly guarded. I had to find another entrance. Huh? Is that Zane? Right then, he saw me and immediately dragged me into a corner, signaling me to keep silent. Be careful, or they will see you. What are you doing sneaking around? I'm afraid my parents might be doing something sketchy. Explain. I've heard them talking with the press to keep posting those defaming articles about Oscar's family. And they even mentioned something about revenge. So you followed them here? Suddenly, I was forbidden from seeing Selena as the doctor said she needed absolute peace to heal. But it feels like my parents don't want me to talk to her. Come to think of it, it's also them who made me suspect Oscar from the beginning. That's what I thought. But why should I believe you when you've been saying awful things about Oscar? Maybe you're working with them. Last semester, I studied abroad. That's when Selena and Oscar started dating. All the things I knew about them were told by my parents. Actually, believe me or not, I'm going to find out the truth with or without your help. Seeing his determined attitude, my heart softened a little. If it's true that your parents were up to something bad, are you still willing to expose them? If so, what they did is just wrong, and I need to know why. Right at that moment, I got a call from Dad. Well done, Faith. You were right. That video was fabricated. I believe you, Zane! Three days later, it was reported that Oscar's mom resigned due to the recent scandal. Then Dad showed up in an unusually neat suit. You better go get ready, kiddo. The Martinez's invited us for dinner to celebrate solving the case. I think they might throw in a bonus on top of the initial amount. My dad is quite the performer, isn't he? All right, time to solve this case. At the dinner, everyone seemed extremely happy, especially Mr. Martinez. Thank you so much for giving us the closure we needed for our daughter's accident. 
No, I have to thank you for giving me such a big case. Now people will line up to have me solve their cases. <laughs> They kept toasting, laughing, and talking happily like two old friends. Then Mrs. Martinez went to get some more food for them. I turned to see Zane, looking a bit sad. I didn't expect Dr. Davis could stoop this low. She got what she deserved. How dare she say our medicine was of poor quality and rejected the license? She almost ruined our plan to make loads of money. What a wet blanket. Luckily, we got quick-witted to stage a fake accident to frame her boy. Hearing that, Mrs. Martinez quickly ran to cover her husband's mouth, but couldn't make it in time. Aha! So you admit everything. I recorded them all. This will be evidence to expose you in court. We admit nothing. Check your recording. When I turned it on, it was all static. We couldn't hear anything. Unfortunately for you, this is the family business room, equipped with signal jammers and anti-eavesdropping devices. So you have no evidence. Mom, stop it. Right then, Oscar walked in with Selena on a wheelchair. Why are you here? You're supposed to be at the hospital resting. All thanks to my mom. She knows someone in the hospital and could help Selena get out. Or else, how long were you planning to keep her locked up? It turns out Selena had woken up a week ago, but her parents kept it a secret. That's why Zane wasn't allowed to visit her out of fear that everything would come to light. Mom, that's not enough for you. You asked me to pursue Oscar at first to get close to his mom, but when the plan didn't work out, you then forced me to break up with him. But I've already fallen in love with Oscar for real. It broke my heart to do so. That night, I was driving in a totally lost mind and crashed into a tree. But who knows my own cruel parents would use their daughter's accident as an excuse to frame Oscar and his family. Oh, honey, you're saying this because you're not well yet. No, we all know what you did. Just confess. Oscar and his mother are good people who don't deserve any of this. I love you guys. That's why I have to make it right. You ungrateful little traitor. Everything we do, we do for you. But it doesn't matter. A court needs concrete evidence, not just the words of a girl. I'm really disappointed in you guys. I hope that you would step up and take accountability. You could have gotten a reduced sentence, but I guess now we need to turn in the real evidence. I held up the confession video of the person hired by Selena's parents to fake the dash cam. At this point, Mrs. Martinez fell to her knees, sobbing dramatically. I paid you to find the evidence against the Davises, not against us. Sorry, but we refuse to accept your money. We don't work for you. We work for justice. Soon enough, Mr. and Mrs. Martinez saw their day in court for their schemes, and the Davises' name was cleared. After the sentencing, Oscar's mom approached me and my dad. Thank you so much for fighting for the truth. You've saved our family's reputation. Our society needs more people who work and live for righteousness like you. I owe it all to Faith. Things would not have turned out the way they did without her master plan. From the fake resignation to Selena's hospital escape, and even arranging a play to expose the Martinez's. It's true that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, isn't it? She's about to surpass my skill. I'll let you keep this for a few more years. It's true that I hadn't been interested in my father's job before, but this case made me realize my passion for solving crimes. So, we'll see. Now all the crazy things finally settled. Oscar and Selena are back together after everything they've gone through. They deserve to be happy with each other. Is this just me, or is their story really similar to Romeo and Juliet? Except, in the end, they're happy together. Suddenly, Zane walked up behind me. Wanna dance? Are you sure? You're the one who said I was a danger to myself and others. Then it's a risk I'm willing to take. Hey, I'm Sage, but you can call me Witch. That's what all the townspeople call me anyway. My folks run a funeral home called Black Rose, and some superstitious people consider this a bad omen. By some, I mean the entire town. Everything about us is spooky and weird. Want to see our house? It kind of has that monster house vibe and looks like a fort in the middle of this dollhouse neighborhood. I did try making friends with the other kids, but it never worked out. Ah! Don't eat the cookies! They're poisoned! Despite all that, Mom and Dad found their work meaningful and put a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe a little too much? I guess the reason why they're so emotional is because they know what it feels like to lose someone dear to them. My little sister Leah's missing, and it's all my fault. We'd searched for her everywhere for five years, but still, no news. It was a terrible time for my family, but instead of showing us support, 
the neighbors spread absurd rumors about Leah's disappearance. Some said the devil took her, while others said we sacrificed her during a satanic ritual. These heartless people were never going to change their minds about us, so I decided to just go along with it. This is why no one dares to bother me, as they don't want to be cursed- Ouch! Oh, sorry, miss. We're just trying to catch that bird. Please don't curse us. Jesus, that poor little thing. If you hurt an innocent creature again, I'll turn you into one and see how you like having stones shot at you. Blood drained immediately from their faces as they screamed and bolted. I carefully took the bird out of the bush, then brought it to my forest house. This is my secret hideout deep in the forest. I have my own garden where I plant herbs to heal injured animals. This isn't a wild bird. It even has a name. Must be someone's pet. Okay, Sky. So you like to sneak out, huh? The world out there is dangerous. I should bring you home. I followed the address on Skye's tag and took her there. Guess her owner wouldn't be happy if they thought a witch had cursed her, so it's better not to show myself. No one wants anything to do with a witch. But no matter how annoyed or scared they acted, I just don't care. Having the place to myself has its perks. But then out of the blue, a guy slumped on the chair opposite me. How dare he? I could feel his eyes peeking at me. Another idiot wanting to test his courage. Hey, Sage, right? We're in the same English literature class. But in case you didn't know, I'm Mark. Why should I know your name? Oh, I... I just wanted to... If you don't want to get diarrhea, sleep paralysis, or skin rashes, don't ever talk to me. Then I turned around to leave, but tripped over something and fell forward. You alright? This is crazy. Who asked him to do that? Then I came home to find an angry crowd in front of my house. Those eerie sounds are keeping us awake at night. What kind of dark magic are you practicing? Your black sorcery made my curling iron overheat and burn my hair. Must be some demonic influence messing around here. Turns out, strange things were happening to every house in the neighborhood. So these superstitious people blamed everything on my family and even wanted to kick us out. We can't move. We have to wait here. For Leah. She's with the devil now. She's obviously not coming back. So go away. Never talk about my sister like that again. Get out of here. Coincidentally, there was a loud rumble of thunder right at that moment. Horrified, they started pointing and calling me a witch. Go home, everyone, for your own safety. I'll take it from here. This man is Mr. Thompson, the town's mayor. He came with an offer to help our family move away in peace. Believe me, it's best for everyone. If and when your daughter comes back, you'll be informed right away. After he left, my parents seemed to be thinking about moving away for real. What's gotten into them? We didn't do anything wrong. Why do we have to leave? I'm not going anywhere. My parents might be weak, but I'm not. I'll wait for my sister here. She promised me she'd help me care for those poor creatures. She will be back. Achoo! What was that? It sounds like a guy's sneeze? Who's there? Show yourself! Ugh, you idiot. Come out alone. Both of you. Now. Those two look familiar. Right, they're Meg and Nick, the infamous best friend duo in my school. It turns out, they were curious about the strange phenomena happening at Meg's house too. They wanted to see if I was really using witchcraft to cause all that. We didn't expect to see you healing animals here. Why do you let people think you're a witch? They can call me a witch, an alien, or whatever. I don't care, as long as they leave me be. I hate it when people annoy me, which is what you two are doing now. Quit following me and never come here again but they didn't leave. Instead, Meg told me about a black rose that always appeared at the scene. Of course, it reminds the townsfolk of my family. Nick thought that made no sense. I mean, if it really was us, why would we make it that obvious? Hmm, someone's clearly trying to frame us. That's it. If I found that person, my family could live here in peace again. We'll investigate together. We can catch the bad guy and be heroes, like a detective squad. Sounds like you've been watching too much Scooby-Doo. And why aren't you guys scared of me? Actually, I'd make a great Daphne. And come on, we just saw you feeding the cats. Even if you are a witch, then you must be a kind one. The next day, I was going downstairs when I heard some chattering noise. Are those angry townsfolk back? I was about to scare them away, but I saw my parents warmly welcoming Meg and Nick? This is the first time I'd had friends come over, so my parents were overreacting. I hurriedly pulled my so-called friends out of the house. I guess disturbing me has become a habit to you, huh? We didn't know how else to contact you. Anyway, we'd like to introduce you to an IT expert. He's agreed to help us. Then suddenly, a guy standing behind the black rosebush appeared and said hi to me. Isn't 
that the guy from the library? This is Mark, the newest member of our squad. Good to see you again. I hope you'll remember my name this time. So, this Mark guy was really serious about this. He's now telling Nick how he could get data from all of the cameras in the neighborhood, which sounded like some kind of alien language to me. Look, our tech genius found something. Mark is awesome, right, Sage? Um, I guess? Um, someone hacked into these houses' networks and was causing their electrical appliances to go haywire. And every night at 11 o'clock sharp, the camera would be disconnected. Not for long, just enough for someone to place a black rose at the scene unnoticed. Can you track down that hacker's IP address? Yes, and also their coordinates. That's Clara's house? Wait, Clara? The drama queen who always plays up everything about me? Does she hate me that much to target my whole family? We reached out to Clara to talk privately, but she flat out denied everything. What is wrong with you? Did this witch hypnotize you into becoming her slave? Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> we have proof. You can't get away with this. Are you threatening me? This is illegal. I will tell my father about this. You think you're a big deal just because your father is the mayor? Big enough for you to watch out. She's the mayor's daughter? What's with that smug attitude? Everyone in this school remembers how she embarrassed herself last year after Mark rejected her. You may not know this, but Mark is the most popular guy among the girls in our school. Eh, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in those girls. You don't have to explain yourself to me. I don't even care. The atmosphere suddenly became weirdly awkward. Well, now the only way is to stalk Clara and catch her red-handed. But we've been sitting here for an hour and nothing's happened. This snooping scheme is so silly. I was about to leave when Mark stopped me. Someone was coming out of Clara's house. Gotcha. Still trying to deny it now, Clara? Mark took off his mask, but who's this man? He suddenly flung out, then attacked Mark and ran off. We were about to chase him when Mark cried out in pain. Meg and Nick told me to take Mark home while they chased after the guy. I brought him home. Hmm, this house looks so familiar. Oh, this was the owner's house of Skye, the bird I'd saved. Mark explained he'd seen me bring Skye back and was impressed with the note I'd left on how to take care of its wound. I knew everyone had been wrong about you, so I wanted to thank you and be your friend. I'm not someone who could make friends. Then I quickly left. The next day, Mark helped us arrange a meeting with Clara at the cafe where he worked. When Clara heard about the man coming out of her house last night, she seemed shaken and said he was probably one of her dad's staff. However, when Meg asked her for her help, Clara refused. We hit a dead end again, but Mark said he already had a solution. Before he could tell us, the cafe owner appeared and told me that spooky stuff was happening and asked me to leave. The holy statue, the town's symbol, was broken, and they found another black rose at the scene. Meg and Nick immediately jumped to my defense, but he didn't listen. He also forbade Mark from hanging out with me, or else he'd fire him. I'll leave now! See? I'm not good at making friends. I only bring them trouble. I dashed away so no one could see me cry. However, suddenly, someone's hand grabbed mine, then pulled me onto the bus just as it arrived at its stop. Mark? What are you doing? He'll fire you! I quit. That kind of boss doesn't get to fire me. It's all my fault. Don't worry. I have a ton of different jobs. Waiter, dog walker, even babysitter. Anything that makes money. What's the money for? This bus will take you to the answer. We got off at the last stop. An orphanage. So Mark was donating the money he earned to these orphans. Promise me you'll show them your true kind side. At first, I wasn't sure if I could, but then I gradually opened up to these sweet kids. Suddenly, I saw a familiar figure watching other children having fun from afar. Is that... Leah? My sister? Turns out, five years ago, a lost kid was found wandering by the bus stop. She was so scared that she couldn't remember anything about her family. She only said a few separate words like funeral or dead people, so the nuns thought her parents had passed away and took her in. During her time here, she couldn't blend in with other kids. Seeing how Leah pushes others away, I saw myself in her. She shouldn't live her life the same way I do. I then called my parents and they came to pick us up right away. Oh boy, it surely was the tearful reunion of the century. Thank you so much. We only found Leah thanks to you. I'm glad to help, but that's not all. I've got something else to show you. As it turned out, Mark bugged Clara's phone at the cafe. 
It recorded a call she had with her father, exposing him as the culprit behind the town's mishaps. It appears Mr. Mayor wanted to build a shopping mall, but he needed to clear up some space for it. Using my family's bad rap, he played spooky tricks on the townspeople to scare them into selling their homes for cheap. When Clara found out the truth, she begged her father to stop, but he refused to. Meg and Nick posted the recording on the internet, causing outrage among our town. The cops arrested him, and my family's name was cleared. All our neighbors apologized to my family for letting their superstitions blindside them. My parents were obviously touched, so they forgave them all, and threw a party. So, my family was reunited. Not only did I find my sister, but also three good friends. Well, maybe two good friends, and one more than just a friend. I arrived home in really good spirits after an exciting training session, and my mood took an instant nosedive to see my devious cousin Caitlin holding my diary. Oh wow, so your crush is Leo, the swimming club captain, huh? Give me it back. I wonder if the whole school knows yet. Don't worry, your devoted cousin is here to help. Thanks a lot, but I'll do it myself. Stop poking your big nose in my business. Hey, um, first, your nose is much bigger than mine. And second, about Leo, Leo, whatever. He'll be mine soon. Tit for tat. Payback for stealing my boyfriend. How ridiculous. And so not true. She should blame herself for having terrible taste in men instead. No thanks. I didn't want a player like him either. Hi, I'm Megan, the leader of the school scout club. I'm friendly, fun, and love going on adventures, just like my explorer dad. So, of course, girls like Caitlin don't scare me. From day one of my dear cousin moving in with us, it was clear we were never going to get on. I love to run around the garden and learn interesting survival tricks with my dad, while Caitlin can't even stand a speck of dirt. Oh my god! Billions of germs are attacking me! Get me sanitizer! Now! And it didn't help at all that Caitlin's jerk of a boyfriend asked me out right after breaking up with her. Despite my clear disinterest in him, she blamed me. That's when we were officially like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and the prank wars began. She drew on my face in permanent marker while I slept, stuck gum in my hair, and once she even tried to shave my eyebrows. But who am I, huh? I can beat her with only one move. But now, the stakes have been raised. She's going after Leo. So I need to confess my feelings to him ASAP before Caitlin butts in and ruins it. The perfect opportunity would be the upcoming school field trip for top students, which Caitlin definitely can't join. And there'll be plenty of chances for me to impress Leo. But there's one slight problem. It's by a river. OMG, thinking of it made me want to pee my pants already. <clears throat> I have thalassophobia, which is an intense fear of large bodies of water. Of course, I keep this a secret because no one will take me seriously as a scout leader if they find out about this. However, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and no way can I just sit at home while Caitlin digs her claws into Leo. So, I signed up for the trip and set up a master plan for it. Baby steps. I mean, literally, I signed up for swimming in a kid-friendly pool. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Oh, but why are my legs trembling like this? <laughs> it's not like I've morphed into a jellyfish or something. Look, the pool is turning into the scary ocean ready to swallow me. Help! Suddenly, a boy with a floaty bumped into me. I fell on my butt and my leg touched the water. Something grabbed me. Loch Ness Monster! It's eating me alive! Just then, a kid popped up and started laughing at me. It's okay, Megan. Happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. Ah, this is much better. But then I felt splashes everywhere. I tried to avoid them but ended up toppling over and fell into the water. Panicking, I spluttered and flailed about. I couldn't care any less about everyone looking at me weirdly anymore and just screamed for dear life. Suddenly, strong arms pulled me out of the water. Then that guy carried me, and my face pressed right against his chest. Holy moly, it felt harder than a rock. You all right? Oh, my Superman. I'll be your Lois Lane. Ew, snot is streaming down your face. Disgusting. Gosh, this is so embarrassing. I got dressed at the speed of light and ran out of there. Um, hang on. Something isn't right. Hey, missing something? Jesus! This jerk still tried to embarrass me at the last minute? The only good guy in this world is my Leo! As if it's still not enough to call it a day, I came home to see Caitlin watching a scary movie about a giant shark. Sup, 
scared of me already? It's not too late to cling on to my leg and beg. <laughs> Who's scared? This stupid show. It's obviously all CGI. There's no shark in the world that could be that big. <laughs> and um, they're labeled as dangerous, indiscriminate killers. They eat anything in sight. But in fact, sharks are most often the victims. Whew. My acting was not so bad, was it? Finally, the field trip participants list was published. Of course, my name was on it, and Leo too. But wait, why is Caitlin here? She's always wrapped up with boys instead of studying, and doesn't even remember the multiplication table. What, can't accept the fact that I'm a genius too? FYI, I am super quick at math. Really? So what is 356 plus 445? Easy, 234. Huh? That's not even close. But it was quick. See you on the trip. I'll be watching you, sis. The day finally came, and our tour guide is Mike, the best scout in the state. But hold on, why does this guy look familiar? Oh no, that's the guy who saved me at the pool. Scared that he'll expose me, I didn't know what to do but to give him the stupidest smile. To my surprise, he seemed not to remember me at all. Then he asked me to demonstrate the first activity with him, vertical neck climbing. It's time for me to shine. Eyes on me, Leo. Gosh, this guy climbed like a monkey. But don't expect me to accept a loss. I was enjoying the victory when Caitlin approached me. Everyone knows that muscle power is only to make up for a tiny brain. Yeah, great shout, Megan. Use all your energy up in one go just so you can show off. Are they cut from the same cloth? Never mind. Hmm, Leo's looking at me. His eyes are so dreamy. That was even more powerful than ten cans of monster drinks. Nature Hunt, Monkey Bridge, Tarzan Rope, all these challenges didn't make me break into a sweat, and Leo even came to praise me. That's incredible, Megan. How can you do that? Oh, Leo, I only had an apple for breakfast, so now I'm having hypoglycemia or something. I'm so dizzy. OMG, my dear cousin should really get an Oscar nomination for her fake act. I gave my sweetest smile and helped her. Just so when Leo wasn't looking, I tripped her up and she fell face first into a muddy puddle. Leo tried to wipe it off, but ended up turning her into a monkey. Then Mike walked past and said, Wow, this layer of makeup is a big improvement. His caddish tongue seemed not to leave anyone alone. In the afternoon, I took my free time to wander around and saw a pretty bird. Hmm, I wonder what it is. That's a red-capped mannequin. Very popular in Central American forests. Wow, good knowledge. Thanks for telling me without being asked. They have a signature dance to impress their mates. Any idea? A moonwalk that rivals Michael Jackson's. <laughs> Wait, what? Why did I laugh so hard? He might be funny, but he's still a jerk. The last activity of the day was using rocks to make fire, and I was paired with... Leo. Thank you, universe. I squidged up close to him and offered him a mint. He happily took it, but then suddenly turned red and started choking. I leaped into action and hit him hard on his back, making the mint fly out. Leo immediately took my hand. My guardian angel, where have you been all my life? Anyway, would you like to join me for a walk later? I have something to tell you. Yes! Oh, I mean, sure. Where do you want to go? The riverbank. Romantic, right? <laughs> R river? I'll die there. But so what? This is my chance. If I die, I'll die under the title of Leo's girlfriend. Totally worth it. I arrived to see Leo already waiting. His skin was glistening beneath the setting sunlight. Hmm, he was like my very own Edward Cullen, but it didn't make me any less scared. Oh, you're here. You look pale. Are you sick? Oh, no. No, I'm fine. Great. Let's get on the boat to enjoy the view. I closed my eyes tightly and squeezed Leo's hand. Then Leo kept talking, but I couldn't hear anything until... Megan, I've admired you for so long. Will you be my girlfriend? I turned into the ripest tomato, but managed to blurt out, I I'd love to. Gotcha! Gosh, why is Caitlin here? I was still in shock when Leo jumped out of the boat and... High-fived Caitlin? Then they kissed? Surprise! Surprise! Now you know how it feels to have your dream guy stolen away. No! No! Please! I, I can't stand it! The water is scaring me! Just enjoy the view, Megan. Where's that fierce girl gone? Your mom told me that you have thalassophobia, but I didn't expect it to be so real. Don't worry, I'll show this to the whole school so they'll come rescue you. Good luck, cousin. Leo and Caitlin walked off holding hands. 
I stayed as still as I could in the unsteady boat. The world was spinning around me, but I couldn't do anything but cry. Time went by like a decade had passed. Then I felt a pat on my shoulder. Mike stretched out his hand, then swooped me up in his arms and carried me to the lawn nearby. But how did you find me? I saw the video Caitlin just posted, then immediately went to look for you along the riverbank. Is that so? How embarrassing. He kept silent for a while, then said, You might not know this, but I used to be freaked out by heights. My acrophobia is better now, but still. No way! You nailed the climbing challenge earlier! If you want to overcome your fear, then you have to find a way to face it. Be courageous. Don't let it become a weakness for others to laugh at. Then he gave me the sweetest smile, and right at that moment, he looked kind of different to me. More attractive. That night, I shut myself away in my tent while the others gathered around the bonfire. I wasn't ready to face anyone just yet, and my mind was too restless to sleep. The next morning came the boat race. When I arrived, all judging eyes were on me. I was nervous, but soon plucked up my courage and spoke out. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan, and I have thalassophobia. So, I can't complete this challenge. I'm embarrassed. Not about my phobia, but about letting myself live in fear of it. I love being a scout leader with all my heart, so I'll try to beat this. Fear is not your enemy, it is your motivation. Then I walked off to cheering and clapping. Back at the tent, I saw Mike waiting for me. That's the spirit. You're really brave and have the qualities of a true adventurer. Even when you're not in the game, you've already won the special prize in my heart. Everything went smoothly after the field trip. Even Caitlin stopped bothering me. She must be busy being lovey-dovey with her new love. Until one day, I saw her arrive home sobbing. What happened? The jerk Leo, he cheated on me with two, no, three girls at the same time. Excuse me? Why is my life so miserable? I know I can never outsmart you or be as brave, as confident as you, but do I not deserve at least one nice thing? I didn't know Caitlin had this self-deprecating side. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her. She is my cousin, after all. Don't cry. I'll help you teach him a lesson. Really? Megan, I'm sorry for letting my jealousy turn me into a monster. Are we good? The next day at school, we stepped into the hallway and heard a horrified scream. It was Leo with his locker full of cockroaches. He freaked out so much that his friend had to catch him before he fell over. Oh, Leo, I am just warming up. I gathered my classmates and showed them the extra special gift I'd prepared for him. Hello, everyone. This time on Name a Cockroach After Your Ex, we have here a gentleman named Leo Whittemore. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone! Everyone burst out laughing and Leo literally fainted. And now he's known as Leo the Roach. Actually, this was all Mike's idea. So we can both retaliate against Leo and donate to the Cry Me a Cockroach Wildlife Fund. And back to me. To make things right, I decided to go back to where I started. I realized nothing is impossible when you believe in yourself and when you have a perfect companion to give you the gentle nudge you need. They say gymnastics is the queen of sports, and I say I'm at the queen moment of my life. I made the perfect landing and earned the gold medal. As I strutted back to my spot, this man rushed over to me. Your skills are impressive. I'm Nick, the Nationals coach, and I want you on my team. My ears began ringing, and my head felt like it was spinning, and I thought I was going to puke. The nausea wouldn't go away, while my super excited teammates kept pestering me. Say yes, Kylie! This chance is one in a lifetime. I can't take it anymore, so I opened the door. No, I don't want to have a man as a coach. I hate you. I hate men. Hi, I'm Kylie, and there's a valid reason why I dislike men so much. My mom passed away when I was little, and instead of spending time with me, Dad became a serial dater. He always made excuses. People can't live without love. You'll understand when you're older. If this is what love did to people, then I didn't want it. I swore to never fall in love. Nuh-uh. 
I went to an all-girls boarding school, and as the years passed by, my hatred towards men grew. Just being around that man smell made me feel dizzy and nauseous. At home, Dad was waiting for me with his typical Hulk look. Kylie, why did you refuse to join the national team? Why turn down your dream? My dream or yours? As if you care, you were never there for me. That's your future, Kylie. I'll be fine. No way universities would turn down my talent. But what if you couldn't graduate? Dad, my grades might be bad, but I'm not that dumb. No, my business isn't doing so well. I can't afford your tuition fees anymore. You'll have to move back home. Wh what? If I don't graduate, then I can't go to uni. If I can't go to uni, then I can't find a job. And if- There's still this scholarship offer from another school for you to consider, though. I immediately agreed to it. I couldn't sit here watching Dad flush away my dreams with his incompetence. Yeah, a new environment might be a bit challenging, but I'm a tough girl. I can do this. Only the next day, Dad dropped me off at a fortress-like building that was, apparently, my new school. And to add more to the problem, standing there to greet me was a boy. Ugh. Now I officially had bad vibes about this place. I reluctantly followed him to the vice principal's office, and I had to sit there with my mouth covered. He pushed a form towards me. You don't look so well. Just let's get this done quickly. Please sign here. Then the vice principal reached out for a handshake. Welcome to St. John's All Boys High School. Sorry? All boys? Yes, that's correct. You're the only girl here. I barged out of the room. The corridor was full of boys. They were everywhere. Welcome home, Rosie. We've been waiting, Rosie. I tried to dash past them, but it was so overwhelming that I tripped over my own feet and this boy stopped my fall. But my churning stomach had something to say. Blech. I threw up all over him. This boy shrieked out and let go of me. Everyone got down at me like I was some sort of exotic bird. With whatever dignity I had left, I pulled myself up and limped back into the vice principal's office. I reject the scholarship. You just signed the paperwork. You can't just leave. I was so mad and speechless. Dad must have set this whole thing up. It seemed I had no choice but to endure this hellish place. So, on the first day of school, I covered myself from head to toe like a ninja. But what are those banners? For me? I went into the classroom trying to not throw up. This place was seriously weird. I didn't sing, and I wasn't called Rosie. When the teacher told me to introduce myself, I decided to use this opportunity to set some ground rules. My name is Kylie. I don't sing, and you are all gross. I demand that you stay at least six feet away from me at all times, else I will backflip kick you into another dimension. To my surprise, the students weren't intimidated. Instead, they all applauded and wolf whistled me. Ugh, I hate boys. I trudged over to my seat and was about to sit down, but then someone kicked my chair away. I turned to glare at the culprit. Oh, it was the boy I puked on yesterday. Stay away. I don't want any more vomit on me. Kylie and Jerry are both new students, so help them settle in, everyone. So, Jerry, huh? He glared back at me, in the midst of all the Cheshire cat grins from the other school boys. Oh, this is gonna be hell. After class, the boys followed me every step, so I had to do a somersault to get away. But that only made them cheer louder. I rushed back to my dorm, but the situation was not better. Had they never seen a girl before? I locked myself in my room every night and only left to make a quick dash to the canteen for food. After a week of living like this, I was so not okay. I was miserable in class and lonely at night. One evening, I was scrolling through my phone when I saw a hiring post from a cafe near my old school. Hmm, if I had a job after school, I could avoid the weird boys and hang around with my old friends. So I applied for the job, easily got hired, feeling all excited until I bumped into Jerry. Why, Why are, are you, you here? here? I hurried out of the kitchen. What to do now? Is this jerk haunting me or something? But I really needed this job, so I stuffed a piece of paper into Jerry's locker, saying that as we both snuck out of the dorm to work, let's keep this secret together. And surprisingly, he agreed to that. But that wasn't the only problem. I encountered a slippery issue, having butterfingers. I spilled coffee all over the floor, then slipped on it, dropped a cake on some woman's lap, and man, the amount of cups I've broken. I begged the owner to give me one last try as a baker, but the final products were horrifying. I was feeling disappointed when I heard someone say, Classmate, need any help? Oh, Jerry and his man smell. I rushed to the bathroom. Is everything okay in there? I'm okay. Just stay there. I'm allergic to men. I heard Jerry laugh, so I explained to him how I was being deadly serious, and being around men made me nauseous. Oh, so that's why you threw up on me that day? Hey, maybe I can help you with your job. Yes, and no, I don't need your help. I'm not doing this for you. I- oh god, what are those? Breads? I know, it's horrible. Please stop. 
Kylie, as a devoted employee of this cafe, I insist on doing this for the customer's safety. On hearing this, I agreed to let Jerry help me. Thanks to his remote directing, I finally made a successful batch of bread and managed to keep my job. Since then, we have become a lot closer. Jerry had this idea to cure my allergy to men. He slowly let me approach boys at my own comfort level. At the cafe, he encouraged me to take the orders from male customers. At school, he helped me study in a group with some of his friends. At first, I was wary of them, but I guess they weren't so bad. Not only that, they also threw me a boys 101 intervention where they humorously analyzed boys' behaviors to help me get along. From how boys greet, yo, what's up, how they posed for cool photos, to the way a typical boy flirted. Are you a parking ticket? As you've got fine written all over you. That's how you flirt with girls? <laughs> Hilarious! You don't like it? But what if I tell you I was being serious? I like you, Kylie. I immediately covered my mouth, but not because I felt nauseous. What should I do? Say yes, or... Suddenly my phone rang. It was Dad. How's school, sweetie? Got a boyfriend yet? That's all he cared about? Right. That reminded me that all this was just Dad's setup, and I can't give him what he wants. No boyfriend! I yelled, then hung up. I turned around to tell Jerry to stop joking around, but the boys were already pinning him to the ground. How dare you flirt with Rosie? She's mine, not yours. Stop! I grabbed a magazine and declared, I'll never date any of you, ever, because this is my type. Now get out! But the next morning, I arrived in class to see all of the schoolboys in wigs and dresses. They mobbed me, and thank God, Jerry dragged me out of there just in time. Don't you find them odd? They became extremely competitive around me and kept on calling me Rosie? Jerry said he didn't understand either. Something's very fishy about this whole scholarship thing. So we snuck into the administration office to see if my file held my answers. After searching for a while, I found it. But whoever was being described here was not me. I wasn't a straight-A student. I didn't sing nor play the guitar. And I wasn't a social butterfly. Then Jerry passed me a binder labeled Only Rosie. There was a school legend that when Rosie appeared, the only flower in the garden would bloom. Rosie's magic was so powerful that every male student would fight for her love. There really was a flower blooming in the garden. Which means I was Rosie. So they only love me due to some rusty magic? I bet it's the same for you. I couldn't stay in this insane school any longer, so I went home and curled up in my room. On hearing a knock at the door, I peeked out and saw, Jerry? I slammed the door shut. Kylie, listen, this is all me. No magic whatsoever. At first, I thought you were a queen bee who liked the attention, but being around you made me realize you're a clumsy, cute crybaby, but also a strong girl who tries to stand on your own two feet. That's the reason why I like you. Ky- uh, Are you okay? Go on. Please. I like you because you're Kylie, not Rosie. I couldn't hold it in anymore and burst into tears. I finally opened up to people, but it's all fake. None of them wanted to be my friends. They only like Rosie. Then Dad appeared. Of course, it was him who let Jerry inside. Seeing me like that, he seemed sad, then sat me down to say something. Actually, your mom used to go to that school, too. Mom was a prodigy who excelled at both studying and singing. When the school's reputation was declining, the principal broke the rules to invite her to attend the school, in hopes that she would lead them to some achievements. At first, the male students objected it, but gradually, with her talent and good nature, she gained their respect, and they fondly called her Rosie. Your mother was incredible, and I couldn't believe my luck when I won her heart. I felt so lost without her that I tried to fill the void. I jumped from one relationship to another, leaving you all alone. Only later did I realize I could still find joy in life even without Rosie by my side. Kylie, I risked sending you to that school because I wanted you to face your fear. Don't dismiss love just because of your painful past, like I did. I finally understood where Dad's behaviors came from, and I felt so sorry for him. Hmm... Sorry for interrupting, but if Kylie's mother was the first Rosie, and her magic immediately charmed everyone, then why did she face objections at first? Oh, actually, only Rosie is merely a myth. There's no magic involved at all. Over the years, the story must have evolved into that fairy tale. Now that Jerry mentioned this, I realized my file looked more like Mom's than mine. Even before entering this school, everyone was talking about you being a musical prodigy and only dating top students. It's like someone created a fake image to make you irresistible. Dad said it was the vice principal who offered the scholarship. 
We put two and two together, and we were convinced that he must be behind all of this. Dad and I went to school to confront him, but he denied everything and even expelled me. The next day at work, Jerry told me something big. There are rumors about another schoolgirl. It looks like the vice principal wanted to find a new Rosie. This had to stop. He couldn't keep on using girls like this. It was about time his lies were exposed. The three of us falsified tons of female students' applications and finally got selected. On the day of admission, Jerry disguised himself as a girl and me as a boy, then went to school together. All the boys gathered around Jerry and gawped at him like he was the new iPhone or something. Then the vice principal introduced him as their new female student, Jessie. Hi, I'm Jesse, and I want to tell you a secret. Then he started ripping off his wig in the most dramatic way ever, leaving all the students gasping in shock. What? You don't think I'm pretty? Poof! I gripped my stomach and tried to control my laughter. You're very pretty. Oh, silly. I'm not just a pretty face. I'm also a musical prodigy. Then he pulled out a violin and started making scratchy noises, deafening everyone. Not to mention, I'm a very delicate little flower. Then he broke the violin in half before everyone's terrified eyes. That's my cue to step in. I took off my disguise and pointed at Jerry. Sneaky little snake. You trying to steal my men? All boys in this school are mine. Then I charged at Jerry and grabbed his hair. W why are you here? I've expelled you. Everyone was astonished to hear that and questioned the vice president about it. Then I waved the flower I was holding around. Guys, there is no only Rosie. This is the flower that heralds Rosie, and it looks pretty fake to me. The boys became even more heated towards the vice president. Fine, I did it. So what, only Rosie is not real? As long as it works. I only did this to revive the school anyway. This school deserves a principal who's as dedicated as me, not a has-been who never even shows up and could have retired by now. He was hopelessly yelling while a group of disgruntled students dragged him outside. The rest ran over to me and said they missed me. So even among all the lies, our friendships were still real. And better still, I didn't feel dizzy or sick at all now. Everyone was here to cheer me on. The boys, dad, and of course, my soon-to-be boyfriend, Jerry. <laughs> We're not dating yet, cause girl gotta play hard to get. <laughs> Suddenly, a voice interrupted our celebration. It was Nick, the national team's coach's voice. Great performance. Any chance you've reconsidered joining the team? Reconsidered? Nick, count me in 100%. No, a million percent in.